Good evening, everybody. Um, it's now seven fifteen, so I think we'll start. Thank you very much for coming to tonight, and um, welcome to all all the members in the public or in the public gallery as well for coming. Before I start, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone. I expect you to treat all members of the committee with respect and to accord the same respect to officers and other people who have been invited to speak to this committee this evening. Members of the public who are observing the meeting should not interrupt in any way. This meeting is being filmed by a member of the public, or a couple of members of the public, which is permitted. If anyone in the audience doesn't wish to be filmed, you will need to sit outside the range of the camera. Right. Um, do we have any apologies for absence? Chair, yeah, I can confirm there's been no apologies. Thank you. Um, declarations of pecuniary interest? No. no. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting. Um, do panel members agree that it is a true and accurate record of um, the previous meeting? Uh, matters arising. Um, I think we have one issue about Christmas parking, which I had hoped would be discussed, but I think um, I'm disappointed that we won't have the opportunity to discuss it. I think Chris Lee has something to update everybody about it. Is this working? Can you hear me okay? Um, just, just to um, inform the, the, the panel that the position that's been reached as per uh, the, one of the options that was discussed at the last scrutiny meeting is that the reduced free parking for this year will be what I thought was option three of the last meeting, that is for each Sunday in December plus the Saturday and Monday of the last weekend before Christmas. And I know that members previously had expressed concern about the extent of the free parking and the benefit that was derived from that. So we are testing out a reduced level of free parking this year, which does provide a saving, um, and we'll monitor that, uh, assess it, uh, and look at what changes, if any, need to be made for future years. The saving will be put forward as part of the uh, financial monitoring report, but also put into the scrutiny process for January, so you'll be able to consider it uh, for future years, but we will be operating it for this year. Um, and the other matter arising is an email update to power members. Um, Councillor Kim was on sent, I don't... Um, yeah, uh, James and I had a meeting with the officers to discuss the um, climate, climate change panel and um, we were quite pleased that out of the 10 recommendations um, most of them have been followed through and they're not working as quickly as we wanted them to but that's because of the system thing rather than nothing else. We, we got the impression that um, officers were doing what they can to push it forward, it's been stopped outside here. Right. Thank we're you. quite pleased. Right. And we're checking up in six months' time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's been a change to the order of the agenda. Um, we will take um, Councillor Aidan Mundy, who's the chair of the Plastics Task Group, to update us on where we are with um, or what we've done so far. And then we will bring the um, Perform um, ground maintenance presentation from ID Verdi after that. So, the Monday. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much for bringing my item of business forward and thank you to everyone on the committee for who agreed also. Um, so, yes, I have the, the privilege of chairing the, the single use plastics uh, task group, um, which was delegated by this uh, committee. We met on the 15th of October. Uh, to set, uh, or firstly to hear from um, a charity called Plastics Free Pledge from Claire, uh, their representative, and from Diana from uh, Sustainable Merton uh, to really outline the, 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 both the problem and the opportunity 
and what and learn from what other councils have done, particularly examples from Brighton and the City of London. And I think this the work that we're doing is is is, is really an opportune time. With I mean, for example, we know that figures from the World Wildlife Fund for Nature show that between now and 2030 there'll be an extra million tonnes of plastics being disposed by us in the UK, so that's the equivalent of 87,000 double-decker buses. <coughs> so there's really an opportune moment to, to do something about this. And uh, what we heard um, essentially gave us um, a focus on three core issues, which was how do we, as a, as a council, procure the use of single-use plastics and what the alternatives could be, um, how we could encourage behaviour change um, internally, but also then lead into the third item is how do then we um, share that behaviour change initially outside the walls here and then beyond in the borough. Um, so that's, that's our draft uh, terms of reference with, which I would hope you would all um, agree here. Uh, and then we've got a plan to meet on the, on the 12th of uh, November where we'll hear further from officers about what currently is going on, what plans are currently going on in the council to learn more. Um, and I'm also hoping to uh, that we'll have representatives from an independent living group so we can understand the full impact of making any decisions about banning or suggesting replacements in terms of single use plastics. But I'd be happy to take any, any questions from panel members. Councillor Bacon. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Aidan. Um, I'd just like to change item three from reduce to stop using or reduce. Because we've got to we've got to aim big on this thing. We can't just reduce. I mean that's not um, that's not measurable. I think the committee. Uh, I mean there are many members of, of the of the panel who were there on the night, and perhaps they could speak also on this. But if I can sort of summarise what we were thinking out on the night, is to try and take a measured approach. To, to come if I agree with you, if we can have that uh, total stop, that'd be brilliant. But at the minute, from a product's perspective, there isn't that alternative, that one alternative product. And it was quite welcome to see in the budget, there has been an investment announced for an alternative for uh, plastics for R&D. However, that's only several hundreds of millions of pounds. And I suspect it will be many, many years yet before we have an actual commercial solution, which will replace plastic in its entirety. But I, uh, if, if there is a, if there is a, a word in which would be which the committee would like to strengthen that uh, I'm, I'm open and, and will, panel members will be open I'm sure to, to doing that okay, thank you. yeah I, I, was, I was present there that evening as well and um, I think it was frustrating for all of us because you know we want to change the world and <laughs> we want it to be better but um, as a task group on the council I think we were very um, focused on making sure that we didn't at the end of this whole task group, have a situation where we, wanted, we told the council to save the world and they couldn't. So we wanted to keep the focus of the task group quite limited. But I think we did go pretty far and we were worried about that. We, you know, we were wrestling with that in the meeting for quite a while. How far do we go? We want to go quite far. But I think making sure we focus on the council's um, procedures itself and its procurement is a, is a good way to advise the council how to go forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, I notice in the uh, notes of the draft terms of reference it says after a robust discussion. Um, and I just wondered if that was indicative of a disagreement among this panel of uh, uh, the task group members. Um, and if so, what that disagreement might be and what it was about. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, uh, not at all, actually. It was, it, was, it was really, really exciting and um, fascinating discussion. Um, and I think on, on one level, actually reflecting Russell's point, it's slightly frustrating. Uh, we all, I think we all agree around this uh, table, I hope, that if there is an alternative to plastics, we should go there. But unfortunately, the, the material science isn't, is, it hasn't cracked that yet. Um, so the, the, um, the robustness was, was more in the, in the question and, the, and the, the bouncing away of ideas. And actually the, the, the guests there were really, really instrumental, I think, in, 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 in um, in crystallising our thinking on those three points and were quite helpful in uh, when we were batting ideas back and forth between members. Okay, I think 
quick um, a quick one. Okay. Are you sticking to just these five councillors and are you inviting a member of the public to dis to enter the task group if they want to? Somebody who we know or we think is an expert on plastics in the blower. Are you are you open to inviting them to the meeting? Well, we have already by having witnesses. It doesn't um, say that here, Well, no, so the, well, the first meeting we had, we had two witnesses, one a, uh, an, a, an adamant and very powerful campaigner, uh, or both were, and, and one of a, a, a local champion who had a lot of experience with that. Um, so, yes, and we're always open to, to, to expert witnesses to, to appear before us. Uh, and that's why we've actually asked, um, and Stella's doing a fantastic job of pulling it together, to, to get the expertise in a council together for our next meeting to understand where we are, what we're doing, and the opportunities and, and potential options there forward. I think, um, I think everybody's had their say, so thank you again for your presentation. And now we've got um, Richard Burton from ID Birdie who's going to do a presentation about uh, the work they've been doing in the back. The, the report that you have before you details the contract management and monitoring of the grounds maintenance contract um, and in, as such it provides a, an overview of performance along with opportunities and, and areas for improvement. Um, Richard Burton is the regional director of ID Verdi and he's here with a number of colleagues tonight who I'm sure he will introduce at some point. The intention is they will provide you with a brief presentation both introducing the company, mindful that not all of you have been around when uh, the contract was first issued, but also uh, an overview of performance from, from, from their perspective. And then the intention is to then move on to questions. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair and uh, members. Uh, I've got a brief um, presentation just to give you an overview of uh, ID Birdie and um, the challenges that we uh, we had in the first um, sort of 18 months of the uh, of the contract um, and obviously you've had the report uh, happy to you know, take any uh, any questions at the end um, so uh, ID Verdi so um, as a business we are the market leader in Europe um, we have the largest infrastructure of any UK grounds maintenance company. Um, 60, as you can see, 60 major public sector and 100 private sector clients in the UK. Um, but we are also privately owned um, with private equity backing and um, uh, quite a number of the directors within the uh, business have uh, share ownership. So, you know, we're all committed to ensuring that uh, ID Valley is a success. Uh, just put some uh, basic numbers up there. Our turnover is 120 million in the UK. Um, we, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we partner with a lot of uh, local authorities and indeed submit ourselves and have 110 green flags within the, uh, within the organisation. Uh, we have uh, two and a half thousand colleagues um, employed uh, during the peak season. Um, uh, the services that we offer, uh, we're 85% grounds maintenance business and 15% construction projects. Um, as you can see, we uh, offer all elements from grounds maintenance through to landscape design, landscape construction. Um, sports construction uh, and sports maintenance. Uh, we just put on there some of our 
um, local authority clients um, around the uh, around the country. So the um, the service itself, uh, through two years of competitive dialogue, uh, ID and Verdi commenced the contract in February two thousand seventeen. We transferred sixty one colleagues uh, from Merton and twenty nine colleagues from Sutton. Um, currently running the contract with around uh, one hundred and three core full time equivalents um, against seventy nine that we had in the tender. Uh, and currently. On the Merton part of the contract, we have around 60 colleagues. Uh, we enhanced the original bid structure by um, putting in two contract managers to individually oversee both sides of uh, the borough, and they report it through to a uh, contract director, uh, who likewise then reported through to myself as the regional MD. Um, we're also tasked in the bid in increasing the commercial opportunities with, uh, within the parks um, and also guaranteeing an income back to the partnership um, as well as a share of any excess revenue that we might make. So uh, there obviously have been challenges uh, in the first 18 months of the contract. Uh, contract management was very challenging in the first year. Um, alongside obviously the transferring 2P colleagues um, and uh, them understanding our way of working and us understanding uh, theirs. Um, unfortunately quite a lot of knowledge was lost during the first uh, few months of the business um, with managers that had transferred leaving the business um, which did give us a problem early on. Um, and uh, as you can see you know, absence and sickness was very high. Uh, and then obviously associated overtime costs that, um, that we've paid out. Uh, we endeavoured to bolster the workforce in the first year of the contract with um, 250,000 of, uh, of agency labour. Uh, unfortunately the sports and leisure income has been lower than, uh, than we budgeted um, and, and I, you know, um, not happy, but I'm, I'm quite happy to say that uh, aspects of our own operational administration and management fell below the standard that we would have hoped for um, at the outset of the contract. Um, and uh, the final point I've got on there is that you know, we're hoping to implement the adventure golf in Wimbledon Park, but um, that's had a number of delays, so we're hopeful that um, we'll get that on course for the next year. Positive so um, as we've entered into the second year of the contract, you know, we're much more focused, we've got settled and experienced contract management team. Um, we have uh, done a lot of community engagement in both Merton and Sutton. Um, <coughs> we've improved the back office functions with the transfer colleagues and uh, endeavoured to try and make it more that um, you know, our team are working for the SLWP partnership rather than only working across their individual boroughs. So we've tried to uh, break that kind of uh, pattern. Um, first year of operations on the ground um, was relatively stable um, because of the additional uh, labour that we uh, put in and the overtime that we paid um, with, with few complaints. Uh, and as the team settled into uh, their new way of working. Um, the hard work of the commercial teams to promote the sports and community across both boroughs um, and you know we were pleased that we were able to give back to the borough uh, or to the partnership an excess payment of 152,000. Um, so I've just put on some slides of uh, some community work that we've uh, that we've done. Obviously, very pleased that uh, we gained a green flag uh, for Abbey Rec. Um, there's a picture there of us working uh, alongside McDonald's to love where you live in a litter clean up in uh, in the parks, uh, and our uh, our judges for uh, Merton officers and friends. I thought I'd just touch on um, performance. Uh, 
obviously we do we do monitor performance uh, along with uh, you know the 20 plus SPIs that there are in the uh, tender document you know, we also have the PQMS quality monitoring system that we uh, share with officers so we uh, ourselves and officers jointly monitor um, the standards on the contract we also monitor machinery efficiency so we know kind of the output that we expected in the tender we can monitor to see whether the grass cutting you know is achieving the outputs that we uh, we, act, we expected um, and we're able to uh, have a suite of uh, information that we can you know learn from as we as we move forward um, we yet to implement job manager which is a handheld monitoring device um, as we've had some uh, IT issues but I'm hoping that during 2019 we'll, um, we'll resolve that and be able to implement the whole suite of our ACORN system. Um, and I just wanted to uh, show you that you know, ID Verdi, you know, we, uh, we operate quality, monitoring, uh, quality management systems ISO 9001 and uh, we take health and safety uh, of our workplace and our colleagues very importantly and we are uh, members of 18001 uh, and I've put there on the right hand side um, the current uh, PQMS average score uh, within, the, uh, within the partnership whilst it's uh, not at five which is uh, the point at which the contract receives a 100% uh, bonus we are um, above contract standard. So, you know, we appreciate that it's a, a work in progress and, uh, you know, we're working hard to ensure that we deliver a, uh, a high quality standard. Thank you uh, very much. Before we go to questions, I've got a member of the public who wants to speak. So, uh, yeah, Tony Burton. Okay, thank you. I'm Tony Burton. Um, I'm a convener of the independent Merton Green Spaces Forum. We provide a network of co and collective voice for friends and like-minded community groups for parks and green spaces across Merton. We set up in 2016 in response to the handling of the outsourcing of the contract which you are reviewing tonight. We've worked hard to establish relationships with ID Verdi and convene meetings with them for friends and like-minded groups several times a year. These are very constructive. We have supported efforts to include a community perspective in monitoring ID Verdi's performance and some of the results are in your papers. And it was through our efforts that details of the contract specification were eventually released through a freedom of information request. We ask you to consider three issues this evening. First, ID Verdi needs to get the basics right and is falling short. We were promised an award-winning, multinational company with vast experience. The daily delivery isn't matching up to this. Basic horticultural skills are lacking. Hedges are trimmed, but invasive species are not removed, as one example. Grass mowing is leaving a bad legacy. We now see grass green space users endangered by thousands of shards created as glass bottles and cans, which should have been cleared beforehand are shattered by mowers. Pointless delays are caused by ID Verdi and Merton Council squabbling over whether a seat or a gate or a fence needs to be replaced or repaired because the choice determines who pays. With a large staff turnover, even the most basic knowledge about individual parks and green spaces is often lacking, such as when gates are unlocked or which parts are left wild. We've asked for a basic guide to be prepared for each green space to help induct new staff. There are contradictory messages about funding, with fears of commercialisation sitting alongside private and public schools making heavy use of green spaces without being charged. The speed and quality of responding to local groups is too variable and too many emails about replies and requests go unanswered. Second, Merton Council needs to be much more active in managing performance and enforcing delivery of the contract. We welcome the regular monitoring that shows ID Verdi's performance has fallen short during most of the contract so far. When we add in the feedback from local volunteers, this situation is even worse. We are told Merton Council has docked ID Verdi £38,000, but this seems scant compensation for such persistent failures in performance. We ask Merton Council to enforce the contract more vigorously and publish performance results and penalties more regularly. 
Which brings us to our third and final point. There are simply too many excuses getting in the way of action. We don't want to hear that the contract needs a long honeymoon period. ID Verdi has vast experience of new contracts, and this is its core competency. We don't want any more excuses about staff being spread too thinly or lacking the training they need. ID Verdi should simply employ the staff it needs to do the job. And we really need to do better than blame the weather for disrupting the work programme. If the grass can't be cut, then there's plenty of other work for ID Verdi to prioritise. In conclusion, Independent Merton Green Spaces Forum is here this evening because we really care. ID Verdi is Europe's largest grounds maintenance firm, yet it is still failing on the basics. Merton Council needs to do much more to challenge performance, penalise failure, and expect ID Verdi to ex achieve the high standards we all deserve. Thank you. basically about the performance relations of delivery of lot, what's called lot two, the grants maintenance aspects of, of the phase C contract. Uh, contract commenced on the 1st of February 2017. Uh, after contract was procured jointly with Sutton, of course. Um, the range of services um, is outlined in the report. There's a very broad and diverse range of services. I won't go those in any detail, but it includes sort of basic horticultural things, sports, etc., the things that are provided in green spaces in reality. So the report focuses on the, 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 the uh, performance um, of the contract since the 1st of February 17th when it commenced. Um, there was in fact a honeymoon period uh, during the early phases uh, as the team familiarised itself with the borough, uh, its various assets, because there are many different assets and types of parks, and 60 or so service staff that transferred into the company from the former in-house team. Uh, I'll focus a little bit on the performance quality management system because that's quite a significant device for uh, focusing on the, the, the performance. This is a, a telephone app based uh, management tool. Um, it was implemented in April last year and is really the primary tool by which ID Verdi's performance is assessed. It's, it's a very convenient way, it allows officers to assess and score the condition of parks on a scale of 1 to 7 or 5 represents the, the target figure and sites are looked at on a, on a random basis uh, so that we get a sort of broad and fairly neutral um, feel uh, for, the, for the, the actual performance and, and race for delivery of the contract. And our neighbourhood client officers have conducted some 800 individual site quality inspections since the commencement of the contract. The tables uh, in 2.4, section 2.4, uh, reveal the average scores in 17 and 18. 17 was the first year of the contract, um, uh, with 5 being the target figure, ID Verdi were there or thereabouts, a little bit low most of the, most of the time, but there or thereabouts in terms of that, that figure. Um, in 18, um, 18 was a more challenging year in weather respects. Um, the challenging time in uh, the park service, which is extremely seasonal, was very challenging in the late winter and early spring. It was incredibly wet and late winter, uh, which certainly delayed grass cutting exercises to some significant degree. And that carried on into the middle of May, and that's kind of reflected in the, in the chart uh, for the average score in 2018. Um, there has also been monitoring by friends and stakeholders. Uh, uh, Tony Burton's alluded to that. It's, a, it's a, an initiative that the Independent Friends Forum and ID Verdi in particular uh, have developed themselves. Um, and it's something that's, that's grown since its inception in January 2018, continues to evolve. Uh, but there's a very clear and consistent message that Tony's alluded to. Uh, 
that has, that has come come from that, that that process, and that IDVRA needs to improve its performance in relation to litter, litter bins, and litter more generally. And, and Tony has alluded to that already uh, just a few moments ago. The report outlines um, gives some examples of customer complaints received, uh, some information that provided by ID Verdi, 2.4.3.3, and then some information in the next section, which is provided by the Council's own customer complaints team, and there's details there of the levels of complaints before the contract and also post contract, and they're kind of roughly similar there or thereabouts on average. Information about litter, litter detritus monitoring, that's something that we've done even before the, the contract that I already commenced. Uh, some information there about random sites visited and sort of sites found to be below standard uh, in relation to the DEFRA National Indicator 195. And information also on the bins found to be full. Um, Richard Burton alluded to the service performance indicators, uh, there's 21 of those. And the summary table provided in Appendix 3 at the end of the document uh, summarises those. Green flags is a, is a key indicator of performance for us. It's something we've been involved with in Merchant for a number of years. Through the anti-context, it's a national quality standard judged across the country. Uh, it's precursor with a blue flag scheme for beaches, and this is the equivalent for parks. Um, we increased that, that, the number of green flag award parks from five to six this year and it's, it's fair to say that uh, I do very a significant input into the addition of the sixth site which is Abbey, Re Abbey Recreation Ground. We did a lot of work, a lot of input there into, into bringing that site up to standard and that was successfully achieved. Um, there have, as, as Richard alluded to, uh, been a lot of input in terms of works with the community. Patrick Phillips from Idiverdi in particular has been key in, in that and his team. Uh, and they've invested a lot of time in working with the Friends groups, including the Independent Friends Forum and others, uh, to uh, develop our parks and, and develop some of the volunteers who actually help contribute to their standards uh, and quality. So, in summary, in terms of the performance, um, it's been a little bit, a little bit under, a little bit under the target figure of five. Uh, the PQMS uh, scores demonstrate that the average score for the first 20 months of the contract, contract is 4.84, 4 and generally it's issues such as grass cutting and litter that have been factors that have, that have depressed that score a little bit. Um, and I've very been actually encouraged to think about how to recruit and deploy staff particularly in the key pressure points in terms of parks delivery, which is the spring and early summer period where the grass tends to grow fastest and the weather can be a little bit unpredictable at times. Um, there were inevitably some teething issues. Tony's alluded to some of those. There was certainly a, 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 some issues related to the staff churn in Andy Verdi's operations during year one. Um, a lot of knowledge did indeed go out of the business, but. Um, so 21 months into the contract now, the local operational team is, a, is significantly more familiar with Martin as a borough. It's more bedded in and it's more familiar with sort of contra contractual requirements and the expectations of the community and in, in, in the borough in reality. Um, I've been asked to comment on a number of general things uh, and I'll do that now briefly if I may, Chair. It was a request to generally update on parks. Uh, and some issues to do with trees, so I'll kind of I'll, I'll direct that in the, 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 the paper as well. Would you like me to do that now or later? Okay, well just generally, it was a remarkable weather year. We went from an incredibly interesting spring to an incredibly interesting summer in different ways, and that obviously had consequences in terms of A, visitor numbers, but also in terms of delivering some of the work. Um, Outdoor events uh, is, a, is a key area for my particular service and we continue to diversify and, and expand that service um, in a number of different ways, you know, modifying and extending existing events and some new events were attracted to the borough, including seven outdoor cinema events. We work with Keep Britain Tidy Group uh, on a national private project in terms of litter. Uh, and, and it involved this slightly radical proposition of removing litter bins from one particular part of Collier's Wood. 
which uh, was a very interesting thing, and the outcome was interesting too. Uh, with the support of my cabinet member, who shares my views on those things. <laughs> um, just to return basically to barbecues being a very, very hot summer, um, barbecues tends to occupy a lot of our time in the summer, and the opinions remain very divided about that particular initiative. Uh, I won't mention dog controls, because it's an item later on the agenda, but just basically, briefly talk about water and provision, because I requested to talk about that, and to be apt in terms of the weather. We planted 220 new, 220 new street trees uh, last winter. These were watered regularly during the sort of May-September period with a significant volume of water. And the outcome of that was, was actually a really remarkable and very pleasing and relatively few were lost. In fact, more, more were lost more lost to vandalism and damage by vehicles than were actually lost to uh, what I call environmental causes, causes of which drought is one of those. So we reckon that even at its worst, about 5% of those trees were lost only to drought issues. Um, I, would, I thank uh, the, the tree wardens who are present tonight um, to, for their support in terms of that. Their, 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 their inputs are extremely valuable and they add value to what we do through contractual arrangements. But generally to say that dead trees on the highway are, are removed and replaced as a matter of policy where we're able to do that. Uh, that's generally our policy in that respect. So we will probably replace most of those during the course of this year, if not, not uh, next year. Okay. Um, questions from the panel now? You one? Okay. Yes, uh, thank you for that update and the presentation on Pomp ID Verzi. Um, so my first one is about uh, management of the contract. It was alluded to by Tony Burton that he, uh, the parts group felt there hasn't been enough active monitoring. The report mentions the three uh, client neighbourhood staff. Yep. Are these the same three that are supposed to be monitoring the Veolia contract, which has been uh, somewhat woefully implemented and occupied thousands of hours of time? How come these officers monitor the ID Verdi contract to any extent at the same time as trying to monitor the VOD one? Uh, basically, do you, do you actually need more resources to do the monitoring? If I may answer that question. Um, in relation to monitoring of contract, as you're all aware, we've just gone live with the rollout of the new service. In recognition of the increased demands that we place on the NCOs, we have brought in additional resource to cover the period right through to the other side of Christmas, to the end of the financial year, effectively. So we've increased that uh, resource by another three people. Thank you. Um, on the subject of monitoring, um, I was wondering uh, about buildings within parks and the maintenance and uh, how they're monitored, if you could outline that for me, please. Um, the maintenance of buildings and pavilions is actually a, a, a mixed delivery system. Uh, the, the council retains as the landlord um, responsibility in terms of the, the general and the broad condition of those buildings and that's done through our facilities section. What I call the day-to-day -day tasks, the, the, the cleaning, the topping up of soap and such like is, is an ID very task. So there's, there's that, 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 that distinct split in terms of responsibilities. If I may, um, how how does that work in practice? With the, if the users of those resources have an issue, how how easy is it for them to understand who they need to speak to? Um, I would say that a lot of our users are obviously been with us for quite some time. Um, I know the library very relatively new on the block. Some of the staff are familiar to them, and equally some of the corporate facilities team are familiar to them as well. I think there's probably a good understanding of, of the different roles. As I say, it's you know it, it, the sort of structural issues um, uh, tend to be corporate facilities on the whole, and the sort of more day-to-day -day cleanliness type of situations or, or issues are, are, are dealt with by any already. Uh, are those figures oh, monitored? Sorry, just make a quick answer. Are the sort of complaints and things that are in this report are are they included? Yeah, they would be included when they were formal. Yes. Thank you. Um, ben, ben. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, leading on from that, <clears throat> um, it's got in here, and you alluded to it in your presentation. Are you ready? Um, the ICT integration 
strictly forthcoming. Um, I want to get an idea, of maybe from you yourself, about how much of a difference that would make in the relationship with the council. Um, and as we were alluding to there, what complaints are made to the council and I do early, and how those systems overlap. Um, it seems like there'll, there'll be a delay in that from the report here. Again, I would pick up pick up one of Tony Burton's points. I, I guess um, you know the complaints handling process could be significantly improved by that. That's for sure. Um, there'd be a better system or a more simpler process for actually channeling those those complaints to the right parts of the organisation. Um, you know, because quite clearly some of the issues are retained by American Council to deliver the structural issues in terms of buildings, for example, but some of them are very clearly operational issues. In terms of cutting grass, empty litter bins, etc. So, you know, there should be some one single point of entry, a, a seamless flow, and that would be managed through the, the corporate CRM system. Thank you. And so, okay. so I was going to follow. Are there any learnings from other contracts you've done in the idea about those systems? How you integrate? Uh, yeah, I mean, we. Um, I think the issue has been that. Uh, it's become a kind of uh, two-tier system, unfortunately, certainly in the first sort of uh, 18 months or so, where um, customer complaints, inquiries comes in, but it comes into Merton first because ID really doesn't have access to the uh, partners' CRM systems. So it's the same in Sutton as it is uh, here in Merton. It, it is something that we are working hard to address because obviously if the complaints are coming directly to us, we can react a lot quicker than having, you know, Burton's officers unfortunately having to kind of pass them off, you know, through to us and then us deal with them and then feedback to Merton so that Merton can then pass them back to the um, to the public. So it will make it a lot smoother and I, I think, you know, ourselves and, and officers are are all working towards that happening. Sorry, is there a, is there a timeline? Oh, um, just more about that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think there's been some uh, ICT issues in relation to technical uh, issues. It's something that our technical uh, team are working with Merlin and Southern to try and resolve. So I, I, I couldn't sit here and tell you it'll be next week, but it is something that we are working on to try and resolve. Okay. Oh, you're sure? Okay. On, on, the, on the same issue, we're all captors here, and um, we normally get we get queries, complaints from those the public who we represent. Um, who do we go to then? And will you give us by the end of this meeting a contact detail so that we know who to talk to? So we can contact either. You, you're saying before they wanted to contact you rather than the council. Yeah, we have a uh, we have a um, a dedicated inquiries uh, email. So yeah, you know we can uh, def definitely share that. And do you want members of the public to use it? Yeah, members of the public do use it. So 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 it is being used. Um, but but yeah, no, we, I mean, we do share it with um, you know the officers and the team. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to change tack slightly um, uh, to 2.4.7 in the report, Health and Safety. Um, given the presentation and the uh, alluded to experience of uh, ID Verdi, um, procedural concerns in relation to the inspection of children's playgrounds and Legionella focused water testing have been raised with ID Verdi and been addressed. What were those concerns? There were some initial teething problems in terms of the quality of, of the playground inspections. I, I believe that's part of a, a, a training exercise, and equally with the uh, water safety testing, it was a training exercise, and we needed to be satisfied that the, as an organisation, that ID Verdi's competency in that respect was 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 of was satisfactory to us. So there was a sort of training undertaken in respect to those those particular tasks. So therefore, based on this. They weren't competent, which plays against the perceived experience. Well, I, I've alluded to some teething issues, uh, and the, t the staff churn was obviously quite a, a, a significant issue in that respect. So a number of staff had to be brought up to speed with our expectations, uh, and in terms of the water safety testing, 
our corporate facilities team were particularly interested in this one, uh, and they needed they were they needed to have the, the appropriate training in place for all those who all those who were actually delivering the tasks. So that they, were, they, they felt satisfied of the of the competency and the standard of those those assessments. So the bottom line is they failed. They, they they are in a better place now than they were originally. Right, so not as experienced as related to late. There were some issues with some of the newer staff that needed to be ironed out. That's how I would describe it. Right, thank you. And then, uh, anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, you mentioned in your presentation that you uh, had a disappointing sort of income and, and review of parts, sports and leisure. Um, have you sort of created a management plan to uh, look at uh, spending resource or advertising or just a change of practice to try and boost uh, this uh, level of in income? Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes, indeed we have. And um, uh, partway through last year, uh, Richard Kelly joined us as uh, our commercial manager and uh, you know, his, his main remit is to try and develop um, you know, sports and leisure opportunities within the partnership. Uh, and, and you know, we have been you know, pretty successful in, in Merton and in Sutton. I think probably you know, when I talk about the, um, you know, the results, it's as a partnership as a whole. And, and I do think that you know, we probably have more stru uh, struggled more in Sutton than we have in, uh, in Merton. Okay, can I, I, okay, um, it's down. Yes, mm. um, in your did you say you are a transfer of 61 before Merton. Where did they transfer to, I and mean, what was the reason for that? Was it because we were all the staff or something like that? Uh, as, as part of the contract award, the, uh, Colleagues that were working on the contract prior to IDVD taking over had the right to transfer to us as a business, and, and 60 people um, transferred at the uh, uh, sorry, 61 people transferred at the time of um, uh, oh, February the first. Um, but once they transferred, there were a number of uh, colleagues that decided that, that you know they didn't want to work for. Uh, a commercial organisation, and you know, we, we did have a lot of staff turnover in the uh, in the first twelve months. So is that all filled and sorted out? Uh, I would say predominantly yes. Yes, we're in a much better place now than we were. Okay. Thank you. Going back, um, if I could, to commercial opportunities, um, is there what, what's the in brief? the contractual framework around that. For example, um, does IDVerdi have complete freedom in setting things like pitch fees? Is there any other restriction um, on, on how that works? No, the um, levying of fees and charges is, a, is actually a, a joint uh, responsibility. Ultimately, it's our decision, but we obviously take advice from, from IDVerdi on what they think the sort of market rate would be, but ultimately the decision is the council's. Okay. Changing, changing the subject completely. Um, I get I get a few complaints about uh, weeding and um, leaves from trees that block particularly wheelchairs. Um, could you tell me whether you've, you've got a schedule for cleaning those and how long it will be? How long it is? I would you leave them for two months or three months? A year? Um. No, I mean we have a work program that you know we uh, we work to uh, with tasks scheduled depending on you know what area that might be, be it in the park, open space, uh, public highway. So so no, we we wouldn't leave them, you know. It, but it is you know especially you know this time of year with leaves, you can clear an area one day, and you know by the next morning it looks like you were never there. So so no, you know we are following the schedule. Chair, Chair, if I could just add, really as a point of clarity, when it comes to the highway, weeding and leaf clearance is actually the responsibility of the area. Okay, so the answer that's been given is in relation to all our parks and open spaces. Okay. And, um, 
Yeah, uh, change attack again. Um, we quite often receive emails and complaints from ex staff that we used to employ that are now part of yours or maybe we've gone up on our own. Um, particularly relating to closure times of parks and cemeteries, closing the gates. Um, there seems to be every so often uh, ID really seem to either lock people in or have issues with this or with wrong closing time. Uh, and that these ex staff are having to handle this and they keep giving us a lot of grief. So, can you actually explain what the situation is there and do you have a plan in place to uh, ensure all gates are closed correctly and no members of the public are unfortunately locked in? Um, we, have, we operate mobile uh, opening and locking teams uh, and they have a you know, regular route and round. Uh, Whilst I don't want to um, you know, get into discussing really previous employees, that there, there is a bit of um, mischief making um, in relation to uh, some of the feedback that I've, that I've seen. That said, you know, there, there have been the odd occasion where, and it is very odd, I can you know, maybe one or two where people have been locked in, but we have opened the gates again for those people and, and you know we have a clear procedure for locking gate and you know, making as much noise as we can and going around the park making sure that everybody's aware it's going to be closing within the next so many minutes so so no, i think we do have a robust procedure in place okay before we move on to the next subject i just wanted to ask about your the events that you've been holding in the parks um because I get the impression that they've been very poorly advertised. I know there was one um, uh, event in Collierswood in the Wonderful Park, and as a councillor, I didn't know about it. I found that some residents knew, but the majority didn't know. So, um, in order for it to be a success, I think it's important that the councillors are in, informed and, and kept up to speed with things that are so we can advertise it to residents locally. Could I inquire at what particular event that was, Chair? Um, it was uh, um, it was the the film. Oh, that okay, the, the film one. Okay. Um, well, I do appreciate there's a, the, the, the delivery of events is actually a, a sort of mixed economy thing. Some of the events I have already made people on. Some of the thing, some of the events my team put on, but the vast majority of our events are actually externally produced events. So responsibility for delivering those events, including the publicity. Uh, in marketing, though we do support that, it's primarily then to those external, usually commercial providers to do. I mean, I think this was the first year, it was quite remarkable how many events we did. I think I alluded to seven in, in various sites. It was a very kind of new thing in this borough, and I'm sure it will grow, and awareness of them will become increasingly, well, they will increase over time as people get used to those. But some of the events were actually very well attended, there were several hundred people attended them in some venues. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've, um, thank you very much for coming in and giving your presentation. Um, We're on to the business plan, and uh, in Caroline Holland's absence, I think Chris is talking to it. <laughs> That's what I can call. Okay. So there's, there's very little. <laughs> capital programme uh, for the department uh, and the rest of the council as that's developing. And probably 
the paragraph I'd ask you to re refer to is paragraph 2.3, which sets out the targets to balance the MTFS right across the council, uh, including those set for environment and regeneration. So when this panel next meets in January, uh, I'll be expecting to present savings of at least £263,000 to balance the budget for next year. Uh, and potentially some savings for future years as well. Uh, but those are being developed uh, and will be presented to Cabinet uh, for agreement to be brought forward to scrutiny uh, and that Cabinet meeting will be in December. So, as well as referring you to the, the detailed financial analysis in paragraphs 2, 3, 4, uh, 5 and beyond, which sets out all of those external and internal elements which will affect the council's financial position from treasury borrowing rates, from inflation, uh, salary increases, cost of contracts, etc. etc. They all play into the MTFS and drive that £20 million pound saving that the council must find over the next four years, starting 1920. There are some savings being proposed in this paper. Uh, and you can see those are Appendix 2, but none of them relate to e &R. None of them relate to the functions that come under this panel. Um, so you're not being asked to consider or comment on any of those this evening. As I say, all of the ones relevant uh, to e &R will be brought forward in January. You do have the Emerging Indicative Capital Programme, which is set out from page 41 onwards, at Appendix 4. Um, and just to help through that, on page 41 is the very high level program for the year 2019 to 2023. So that's summarised the EMR down to just four lines. So this has gone up, hasn't it? I think that's working now. Yeah. I'll keep an eye on it. So on page 41, the capital programme is summarised there in, in just four lines for ENR at the bottom of that table. And it shows that uh, in 2019-20, for example, uh, there's eight million and sixty thousand pounds worth of capital. Uh, 7.5 a year after, it's gone up again. And then if you turn the page, um, if you then refer to page 44, uh, you've got that capital programme broken down into a bit more detail, showing you the period 2019 to 2022-23. Uh, and you can see there the variation, the, in, the, the movement uh, in the programme uh, in the very final column. And it's just a £10,000 reduction for uh, Alligate schemes because that's going down from 40000 to 30000 a year, which is reflecting the current demand for those schemes and the amount of capital that we're currently spending on those programmes. Uh, and then you have at page 45 um, the indicative capital programme for the five years beyond 2022-23. Uh, just showing you the, the likely programme, but uh, that far out, uh, the capital programme is likely to change uh, between now and then. So very little change in the capital programme. Uh, we've been through a, uh, a detailed star chamber process to test out our capital requirements. Much of the department's capital is what are called block allocations for footways, carriageways, parks investment uh, and so on. Some of the large schemes are now coming out of the capital programme for ENR. So the Morden Leisure Centre, uh, the spend on that will conclude this year, uh, apart from retentions. Uh, and the other large uh, elements of the programme relating to Morden Town Centre uh, are in the programme for the next two to three years. Um, so our programme has been quite large in recent years. Uh, as you can see, it's coming down to 8 million, 7.5, 7.2 and then 4 million over the next four years. I'll um, close.
close that chair. Happy to take questions. Um, so start with Appendix 1. Um, there seems to be a very big increase in taxi cars, concessionary fares. I was just wondering if you could explain uh, why exactly that has such a massive increase over the next few years. Uh, it's going from 450,000 up, up to 1.8 million in a period of four years, which seems to be a ginormous increase. Uh, I was just wondering if you can explain the re reasoning for that, because that's way above inflation. So I'm not able to help you with that. It's not an area that, that comes under my responsibility. That's Caroline Holland that deals with that uh, area of accounting. Uh, but certainly take that back and uh, ask for a response to be provided to you. Thank you. I appreciate we're not talking about savings tonight, but I, I wondered in, in general terms what, um, what engagement Merton is likely to have with service users and residents over the cuts proposed and any alternatives? It's not, it's not really possible to, to talk about the savings this evening since they haven't yet been in front of Cabinet, but I can assure you that where there are implications for service users, uh, we will enter into all, obviously the statutory uh, consultation that's required uh, and engage with those users. So I'll say more about that when we get to the January scrutiny. Okay, so um, you helpfully referenced page 44, which is part of Appendix 4. I've, um, I found that one earlier as well, made some notes. But a couple of questions first. So the first one I'll ask is uh, parking improvements. It's a 60,000 capital spend. Um, what exactly is that money for? Because it's nice to have numbers, but we don't actually know what these things are for. And that same thing, that same question applies to sports facilities, the one and a half million. So what is it for? Okay. So just answering both of those, the um, parking improvements is, uh, is in there every five years and reflects the cycle of replacement uh, for pay and display machines, but also some investment in uh, both lighting and surface in our car parks, off street car parks. Uh, sports facilities, uh, the, the 250,000 that's in there uh, is a, an annual block allocation reflecting the uh, replacement needs in our three leisure centres and that's the capital liability that falls on the council separate from the revenue liability that falls with GLL, the leisure centre operators. So that's principally things like boiler repairs, uh, window replacements as we've seen this year at the Cannons Leisure Centre. Uh, less so in recent years at the Morden Leisure Centre where we've not been investing capital but more so in the other two. Um, that 250 is uh, is the, the only source of capital we have for those leisure centres. So the one and a half million is a fund that's in there for the desilting of Wimbledon Lake uh, which will almost certainly be deferred uh, into future years but we will need to call upon that allocation uh, at some point in the, in the near future. Uh, thank you. And Chris, could you also have just uh, a clarification on the fleet vehicles as well? So fleet vehicles covers both the passenger transport fleet, that's the 16 and 24 seat buses that take children to school and adults to day centres, uh, and also uh, the council's other vehicles that we use, including such things as the mayor's car, Actually, I think the budget for the mayor's car sits elsewhere, but that's that's a unique situation. But other vehicles that we have taking staff to uh, parking sites so that they can uh, operate as traffic wardens and so on. The bulk of the spend in there is for the passenger transport fleet. This year, just on Monday, actually, sorry, this week, just on Monday, we placed an order for five new 16-seat uh, vehicles uh, because the vehicles are getting to the end of their life. Um, and our policy is to replace them with vehicles that are suitable for the needs and we're projecting that 16 rather than 24 seat vehicles are, are most appropriate. But it's a block allocation reflecting the likely demand for investment in vehicles across the council, but principally that passenger transport fleet. Okay,
No, there's no electric vehicle that exists at the moment for that size and class of uh, transportation. Not within our price range. Um, well, we can't have a meeting about budget without making a reference of some kind, so I'm going to propose one, if you don't mind, for this panel. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with uh, this panel recommends to Cabinet to consider increasing the capital spend on street trees and other associated landscaping by, let's say, 10% uh, to improve the borough's air quality. And we can offset this by reducing uh, the equivalent spend on fleet vehicles uh, because we think air quality is important. So that's my suggested reference more street trees, less vehicles. And I propose that. Um, sorry, can we make sure that the impacts on our current fleet users in terms of those passenger vehicles is considered before we recommend it? I'm all for air quality, but. I wasn't asking for very much, just a 10 percent increase on the trees budget, which is a fair bit smaller. I thought this would be a nice gesture to, uh, you know, a positive thing for this council. Is everybody in agreement with that? Is it possible to ask what impact reducing free vehicles spend is going to have? <coughs> yeah, it, I suppose it depends at what level uh, the reduction of the fleet vehicles budget would be at. But any reduction potentially impacts our ability to replace the fleet. Um, we know that we'll be in that business for some time to come. Uh, we need to take children to school. It's the cheapest way of taking children to school. The alternatives are, are taxis. Uh, and if we don't have the vehicles, then we aren't able to, to meet that. And it is a statutory need for children with SEM. So children to school, adults to day centres, if you reduce that budget, you're always going to run the risk. Um, that said, some years it's underspent and some years we've slipped the spend into the following year. Um, it's not a, an exact science. It, block allocations are always indicative allocations based on an estimate of what you need rather than the absolute uh, evidence at that point in time. Uh, purchase price change, procurement methods change and so on. So I wouldn't say it would completely derail our plans. Uh, but any reduction is going to have a potential impact on our ability to be able to, to get the right vehicles at the right time. Just on the other side of the equation, spending more money on trees is generally a good thing. The matter I always need to bear in mind is the revenue cost of that, because the capital cost is fairly insignificant, uh, putting a new tree in the ground. The revenue cost, not just of watering and pollarding and maintaining that tree, but the potential insurance claims against the council, not just from trips and slips uh, on the pavements, but also adjacent to residential property and other commercial property, uh, where that tree uh, over time, and we are blessed with a large number of trees in the borough, causes damage. So there is a balance to be struck there. Um, I, I absolutely agree that trees are a good thing in terms of air quality and mitigating the impact of climate change. Uh, and the more we can do around tree planting, the better. But we don't live in a finite, uh, we don't live with finite revenue resources. So I have to keep that in balance with our capacity to be able to maintain an ever-increasing tree stock and an ageing tree stock which needs um, constant attention. Can I ask, by reducing the flea, would that affect, um, would that add to the cost overall? Of, because you'd have to um, provide transport in, and that might add a, add a cost to the council. I'm not too sure I understand the question, sorry. Now, if you're reducing the fleet, you, um, f your fleet stock, um, you're going to have to provide that service or make up that service that you're reducing it by. Um, in some other way. Will that affect um, 
will that add a cost to the... Well, I'm, I'm, firstly, yes, we are looking to reduce the fleet, not necessarily the passenger transport fleet, because um, we may actually have more smaller buses to take children to school, rather than fewer large buses. We have a lot of 24-seaters. We may need more smaller buses. It's a different licence arrangement. It's a different uh, type of driver. They're more nimble. They're able to get through the borough quicker. So there may be more of those. But we are looking to reduce the other fleets of the council, uh, those other cars that the council uses, to be uh, both cleaner uh, and more efficient in the way that we move around the borough. Um, and those will be cleaner. They'll be more electric, uh, more petrol if we can't have electric. And my aim is certainly to reduce cost spent on transport uh, and look at how we can get people around, our staff uh, around the borough uh, as cheaply and as efficiently as possible. So I do aim to drive down the capital spend on, on fleet, um, but I'm not sure at this point how much I can reduce it by. But it goes without saying that investment in trees is a, is a good thing. It doesn't necessarily, I would urge your council, it doesn't necessarily have to come from fleet vehicles per se. Clarification. The reason I suggested this because it meets the aspirations of the Mayor of London who is very keen in his latest with various ports and ideas. Uh, he wants less vehicle movements and he wants more trees planted. So that's why I thought it might be a good thing here uh, to help improve air quality as well. Which budget the offset comes from I don't really much mind. Uh, it was just an example of fleet vehicles because vehicles tend to emit pollution. So um, that's the only reason I suggest it, and it's only a token amount anyway. Shall we, shall we put it to the vote and no, see? No, okay. I, I completely agree with the sentiment. <laughs> it's, I think it's just that maybe it is a case of in the future looking at alternate areas to take that funding from, all for trees. But I'd like to protect as much as possible the, the fleet vehicles we've got. Um, maybe perhaps in the future, more clarification about the plans for making how efficient the efficiencies what impact they have but I think what I'd like more detail in the future about that if that's possible um, and with you on the sentiment I think I can quite agree with you on the proposal as, you're, as you've said it obviously I agree with my great mayor of course it's given you opportunity to back your own mayor that's all I'm doing very nice side Shall we put it to the vote? Those in favour? Those in favour? Those against? Two against and three four. And so does that mean I have my casting vote? No, you don't. 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 You Next item is the modern development update. Oh, sorry. I've, I, 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 I'm sorry, I've missed, missed one out. Um, it's the work of the environmental enforcement team. I think that's our thesis. Thank you. I'll just quickly do an introduction. And um, Pat, Pat De Jesus, who's the community engagement and enforcement manager, will be dealing with any detail in terms of the questions that the, uh, the, the committee may have. Um, the yeah, very, it is very short, don't worry. Um, the environmental enforcement team comprises four enforcement officers led by Pat De Jesus, the Community Engagement Enforcement Manager. Um, as you see from the report, the, the team's efforts are very much focused not just on enforcement against littering, fly tipping, abandoned vehicles, 
waste carrying offences, for example, but also on awareness raising, community engagement and prevention. Uh, as a consequence, we work with Kingdom Security, who are contracted to work alongside the in-house team. They are tasked to cover all uh, the town centres and hotspot areas where litter is a particular problem. They also enforce in relation to on-street drinking and other anti-social behaviour issues such as urination in a public space. Uh, the report describes the, rep uh, the approach taken to achieve uh, regulatory compliance as well as providing data on the most common offences by way of appendices. We're more than happy to take any questions associated with the detail or statistics or whatever else members may wish to ask in relation to this report. Any questions? Um, thank you for that update. Um, yeah, we appreciate the work this department does. Uh, my first question is about these letters up 2.6 where you mentioned you arrange for leaflets letters to be sent to individual addresses. Um, do you have a sort of indicative number of how many you're sending or, or if there's a mechanism that we can sort of help arrange it for you? Because we hear these complaints a lot and never, we never really hear any outcomes. So it's a mixture of how many letters and can we have an input into it to try and improve littering um, and issues such as that? Um, yes, um, what we then end up doing is sending letters um, mainly to people that present their waste, how they present their waste. <coughs> so it's down to an individual um, enforcement officer for that particular area. And if there's an issue, um, we'll we're, we're obviously put the letters through the door, just remind people about their collection times and how to present waste. So I think it, that's normally down to our, an individual officer that can do that, I'm afraid, yeah. I think we make suggestions as my oh, right. <coughs> input into this. What, into the letter itself? Uh, into the officer or into the letter, however it forms, because you might have a unique knowledge of the particular area. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask about um, uh, fixed penalty notices for felony ticking and um, hopefully reduce the numbers there, which I think in 2017 was 29 and in 2018 so far is 21. Um, compared against the total number of fly tips uh, recorded, which are elsewhere on our agenda, there's, there's quite a, a disparity. And I wondered if you could outline for us the um, decisions on, and process on on issuing those fixed penalty uh, notices, and, and why why you think there is that discrepancy of that difference in the Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, we rely on evidence. Uh, and that's the key thing. So obviously the numbers that you're seeing there is where we've got evidence of who's actually fly tipped. Um, what we tend to find is a lot of people don't produce the evidence, so therefore it will just be picked up as a fly tip, a normal fly tip. Um, so like I said, if we've got someone who's willing to do a statement for us, who's willing to you saw people that actually fly tipped, we'll take the statement from them, but normally this is all evidence from what we find. And just as a, a matter of process, when Veolia clear fly tips, do they search for evidence at all? They do, yes, and obviously they do pass it through to us. Again, we get statements from them because they've handled the waste. Anybody that handles the waste, we need to get um, statements from, so yes, they do. And just last, very last quick one, is obviously other boroughs, there are some other boroughs that have higher percentages of fixed penalty notices for this kind of thing. Why, why is Merton the way it is? Well, why is there less evidence? Um, it could be to do with staff. I mean, I know we, obviously Croydon, they've got about 18 officers, we've got four. So obviously we do rely on other people to, to assist with us. Like you said, I mentioned the only hour, or ID Yerdy even, who had information from when we've had fly tips in parks. Um, so we do rely on other people. So do we think maybe there's a training thing for ID Verdi or Veolia to, to better look for evidence? Do you think, do you think that's a possibility? Um, yeah, I mean, we work along with the NCOs and the Neighbour Client Officers, so um, I'm sure, you know, we, we've, we've touched on this, we have sort of the straight the fact that we need that information as and when the flight it does occur, and if there is evidence, we need to have that information in order us to issue an FPM. Um, Nick? Um, and it's in relation to the um, COVID operations, actually, on our previous um, uh, scrutiny committee, uh, it seemed to be a reluctance to use covert operations. Is there a reason behind that? Is it just uh, okay. uh, um, I don't think it's a reluctance. Um, the system for getting covert operation now for Ripper is a lot more tougher. 
um, we go through the courts to get our, our, um, our permission. Um, we have to prove the fact that what we've done is uh, a lot of problem solving before we get um, a covert operation agreed. Um, we've had one recently this, this year, we've got another one lined up pretty soon. Um, again, it's a small team, so again, you know, when I do do a covert operation, it just takes officers out of the, the area for some time, and they have got a part of the area to control and look after. So, but we do fit them in as and when we can. Uh, and we do do good results. Uh, I think the last one we did was in Stretton Road. Um, it's about 19 people that got caught for fly tipping, um, all of which have now been either gone through the courts or they've been issued a fixed penalty notice, depending on the size of the, the fly tip that they did. Um, Mike, do you want to have anything to say on that? Thank you, Chair. Um, this falls under my remit, so I just wanted to add something in terms of um, thanking Patrick Jesus and her team and the, the environmental officers as well, the client officers, because many of us, just as members of the public, would see something and then when we get home afterwards say, I should have done something about that. We have these people out every day doing just the sort of things that we shy away from, knocking on doors when they see something outside the house uh, and to say, What's, why is this here? rummaging through bags as I spent a day with one of the, the um, enforcement officers. Uh, not a pleasant task because there's all sorts of things in there, putting your gloves on and actually finding addresses and, and statements and the like. And, and it's a thankless task in many respects because uh, they're out there facing the, the public. And it's a shame that we have to have such a department because it is poor behaviour from the public that leads to this. It's not accidental behaviour. Uh, maybe the littering is, and you know, the, the, some of the tickets at stations, but, but actually when people go out and choose to fly tip, we have to rummage through uh, and get what we can. And we do have a successful six, um, prosecution rate of those we find, but it's actually persuading people to be witnesses. Uh, so I'm not advocating that we all go out there and rummage through split open bags <laughs> and, and have a look in there, but if you do see cardboard boxes by the side of the road, just have a look, see if there's an address on it, take a picture of it, and then report that and do a witness statement. So these sort of things that we've got people out there doing the, the dirty work that we shy away from and we have to take part of that <laughs> and we have to encourage our neighbours to. Not to challenge necessarily if it feels unsafe but to actually try and modify poor behaviour uh, and I do applaud the work they do. I think they do a tremendous job uh, and it was I, I wasn't aware of quite how down to earth they have to get with some of what they do. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I'd actually like to add my support to what uh, Councillor Brunt just said. In fact, I'd also like to take the opportunity perhaps to uh, look one of your offices. Yes, thank yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just a um, very quick last comment um, to, to the cabinet member. I completely agree. Um, I've given a witness statement myself actually with regards to uh, a fly tip, but obviously um, fines would also change behaviour. If you were more likely to get fined, you'd be probably less likely to fight it. Um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Pat, and your team for all the hard work you've been doing over five years now being a councillor. I know it's not a very easy job, and um, I've worked alongside you cleaning up other ways before, so I can understand. But what I want to find out is in a way, when you, be, you do you know, call these people, it can be publicised a bit more. So therefore, someone out there who's going to drop the bag and get somebody, okay, my name going to be on a billboard, or my name going to be somewhere, so I'm not going to do it. Yes, we do. I mean, the, re um, the recent um, COVID operation we've done, we're just getting ready now. We've just done the last court um, appearance, so we wanted to do it as one big hit. So that's gone off to our uh, communication team to be advertised. So we go on our web page as well as tweeting and our um, main pages, yeah. Yeah, uh, one final question. Um, yeah, my thanks too for the work you do. It's, you know, we very much appreciate it. It's just a shame that... Uh, we can't catch more of these people and have the evidence against them. Uh, my question is about, about one of your remits, which is school education. Um, do you have an indication of when you've been into a school and done these sessions, um, do you notice a visible improvement in the vicinity or, or you know, do, do things actually improve or not, basically? Um, 
What we do have is that we do have all 43 primary schools in, in the borough uh, participating into the programme. Um, we do go out with the children um, and do litter picks as well um, on a number of occasions throughout the, throughout the year. Um, I think they're more aware about litter. They certainly do take it home because we've had a conversation with teachers where they're still talking about it the next day. They've even told their parents about don't drop litter. They've had the, the Jerry and the Vandal graphene and he covers the litter as well as your choice. Um, I, I really can't comment on the whether or not it's made a huge difference, but I do know that for the children that I do talk to and I do go to the schools very often, um, that they are, you know, listening, they are now understanding about their responsibilities. Okay, um, look, looking at your staff level, you said there are only four staffs, okay? Is it possible in any way that you could um, train up volunteers to work alongside you so we can have more people on the ground, you know, supporting you? Um, we certainly can have, I mean, we have the street champions. I mean, they do actually give us quite a lot of information and good intel information as well. Um, so I think there'd be a limit of what obviously the obviously the volunteer could actually do, but there's nothing stopping from a volunteer actually, you know, being out of us doing a litter pick as we do, community being a champion, um, being our eyes and ears really, you know. So we're quite open, you know, for people to do that. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, very good. Um, Next, we have the modern redevelopment. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, tonight uh, really is an, an update on progress of, of the, the current work streams of modern regeneration. Uh, we've got a lot of what comes away at the moment, which is just filtering back into the team, so we'll be bringing it back to this panel next year. Um, Sam Paul McGarry, I'm head of Future Merton. We've also got members of the modern team here uh, to deal with questions at the end, should that be needed. <clears throat> so tonight I'm going to um, pick off from the modern housing zone. I think that was the last major update that came to this panel. Uh, and then an update on the, the current work streams and consultancy work, which is uh, beginning to filter back in. Um, I'll give the panel an overview of the timeline and milestones um, and then a quick update on the local plan which has just gone out to consultation and the communications which have been ongoing uh, for the last couple of months. <clears throat> so modern, modern regeneration, uh, this is the, the, kind of the vision image um, which we've been using for TfL and, and the Mayor of London's <laughs> office. Uh, and this is to illustrate, so it's not a fixed design for modern but it's really to illustrate uh, the ambition, the scale of ambition for the town centre. Uh, the Mayor's New London Plan, the Mayor's New Transport Strategy, uh, the Housing Strategy, everything points towards a place like Morton, uh, where it's a sustainable location to build more housing. Um, it's an area in need of investment. There are really good neighbourhoods around Morton and really great parks around Morton, but the town centre itself is not meeting the expectations of the residents here already. It certainly wouldn't meet the expectations of future residents, um, and <clears throat> economically, it just isn't really working. So for example, uh, recent data from TfL, 10 million people pass through Morton every year. But they don't spend any time here and hardly spend any money here. Um, so it's not really a place to hang, hang around. And what we believe <coughs> is investing in the public, public realm um, and actually having more people living in Morton would actually create more of a destination around the town. So for us, we believe it's a bit of a game changer uh, for regeneration in London because a lot of the players here are, are actually public sector. It's TfL and, of London, and TfL and Merton, who are the key landowners, uh, and also talk to the Mayor of London about funding. So we are a long way down the track in terms of um, the next stage, which is to get a development partner, and that really is the key um, bulk of the work at the moment. <clears throat> so um, just to clarify what I mean by modern regeneration, the red line here uh, is now contained in the local plan, uh, and that's what we consider to be the modern housing zone. So that was the boundary we used in the Mayor of London to look at um, the, the core area of development. It's not every site in Morton. Uh, it is largely where TfL and Merton own the freehold. Um, and we've had to include some sites to get that kind of coherent, coherent development site together. We have just written to the landowners 
<clears throat> within the red line as part of the local plan review, uh, review this week. So the, the engagement has begun uh, with the detail. Um, in terms of the project team, Morton is a big project. Regeneration is big, long and complex. Uh, this initially started in 2008 under the Conservatives. We then had the global financial crisis. So that wasn't the time to look at property. <laughs> um, we have done a lot of work in the background with uh, the planning policies, a lot of community engagement. And now we're at a stage where we've assembled um, a quite huge project team. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of due diligence underway at the moment uh, to get us to the point where we can <coughs> attract a development partner. So the lead partners here are Transport for London and Merton. Uh, we have signed um, agreements setting out how we will work together um, and how we, how we will form a partnership uh, to lead, lead the delivery of Morton. Uh, GBA are our project managers and often development expertise. GIA are involved in daylight and sunlight and white light studies, so we can get um, a fix on the development quantum and envelope for, for sunlight. Mott McDonald are the transport engineers. Aspire are advising on uh, property issues. A lot of the, the initial ones they've been in for about six or nine months. Uh, more recently, we've actually pushed them in Wakefield and looking at retail. So what we're looking at is how Morton's performing now in terms of retail. Um, with the new development, what would the demographics of Morton be? What type of town centre would that demographics hold? You know, what type of shops, leisure, uh, business space would be attracted to a new Morton? So we're getting all that detail to inform the planning. Uh, we've got Hawkins Brown, um, commissioned by TFL and Merton to lead on the master planning. So, that, so a lot of the work there is beginning to come into the team and will be fed back in spring to councillors and the community. And we've got Canda, who are the comms consultants, and they've been doing a lot of the on the street engagement already in the last month. So there's a lot of work underway. Um, I appreciate there's not a lot I can show you here tonight because it's just an update. Uh, but this is all heading towards a lot of information in spring before we decide to go to the market and get the development part. <clears throat> So to give an example of the work currently underway, um, this was following the cabinet decisions earlier in the year, which said go, go out and do all this work. Uh, the due diligence is around development viability. Um, there, there is costs um, and there are values associated with regeneration. We have to understand them before we ask uh, the market and developers to work on this with us. Um, we are, we've got advice in the moment on land assembly. Uh, so the majority of the land is LBM or TFL owned, but there are leases in there. A lot of them run out within the lifetime of this project anyway. There will be bits of land we'll have to acquire. So there's a strategy being developed for how we may wish to approach land assembly. Uh, we're also looking at design frameworks. That's, it is about the buildings and what we're building, but actually it's also about the public spaces, the streets, uh, green spaces, um, and actually a new hierarchy of streets in Morton. Uh, and that goes hand in hand with TFL's healthy streets work. Uh, where we're looking at the highway layout and the bus standing facilities, the air quality issues. So all of that is tumbling around at the moment, uh, reaching a conclusion. <clears throat> uh, we're also looking at communication strategy in long term. Uh, this is going to be about a 10 year project. And again, retail impacts. It's not all about the new modern, but actually how the modern impact on colours with Wimbledon and Mitchell, etc. So all that work is ongoing. Um, specifically with Transport for London as the lead partners, uh, we have agreed head to terms. So that's how we will work together how we deal with our land uh, and our associated funding. Uh, about 50% of our time is currently Morton, so we have weekly project meetings with all, all those consultants. Uh, we have also established senior officer meetings uh, with Chris Lee and his equivalent in TFL, um, and the GLA officers are also supporting this. So we hope to conclude all that and form recommendations to scrutiny and cabinet and full council uh, in spring. <clears throat> so the, the timeline for this period of the project we're working to now, the ultimate stage is we want to go to the market and seek a development partner. <clears throat> so what leads to that is the local plan consultation, which has just launched, that is running in some January. So we're going to get, we've done the, land, the policies for Morton and the site allocations for Morton, uh, so we welcome people's feedback on that. Uh, we've got some of the cabinet briefings at the moment. But ultimately, we're looking at um, February for a full council report, which will set out the case for regeneration of Morton, uh, how we will work with TFL, and how we will look, go to attract a development partner. <coughs> I put asterisks there between February and March. Um, we've actually got um, some funding bids in at the moment we're awaiting feedback on, so that may change the timing of those reports um, to cabinet and full council. So that's why we're asterisks for the moment. 
Um, but ultimately what we want to do is early 2019 um, start the procurement process. We have done soft market testing, we've spoken to many developers, housing associations and potential investors. There is an appetite for, for more. Um, but we still have a lot of due diligence work to, to go through before we actually formalise those uh, procurement packs. But that, that is the task in hand at the moment. Um, so all things going well, that, that procurement is about a year long process. So by March 2020, we should have our development partner on board. Uh, that twin tracks with the adoption of the new local plan. So that means all the planning policies and development activity um, dovetails. Um, early starts in sight, we're anticipating possibly 2021. <coughs> so fairly long term to get going. Um, but this is quite a significant project, probably one of the biggest that the councils that are embarked on. So it's, it's right and proper that we get the due diligence right at this stage. In terms of consultation, uh, last month uh, we held a number of stakeholder focus groups. Uh, that was with businesses, um, resident groups and councillors, and really that was to get a feel for is the vision for Morden still right? Although we've done it in 2008, you know, we're 10 years on. Uh, there's a lot of um, similarity. Uh, we're getting the same feedback back from everyone. Uh, we actually had engagement events in the streets um, in Morden, and we're just um, getting the reports back on that at the moment. Um, similarly, a lot of the technical due diligence work um, is what's been ongoing last month. Um, as I say, on, on to October, open plan consultation launched and the Sutton Tramline consultation also launched this week. So there's still a lot of engagement and a lot of scope for people to get involved. And what my team hope to do is pull all that feedback together in the spring uh, for, for members. It's a very quick run through. Um, I won't go into details with the ins and outs of the due diligence, but what I'll do is I'm um, happy to take any questions. A yeah. uh, quick clarification on the local plan. Um, is this the borough wide local plan or is this an, another uh, geographical specific one? Because there seems to be a few different plans floating around at the moment, so you just to get a clarification, will be good, please. Yeah, to clarify, so the Mertens of Your Local Plan 2020 is the borough wide local plan. Uh, however, within that, we have detailed policies for more and detailed site proposals for more. So that's what's out for consultation. Okay. Um, the detailed site proposals for Morden, have they been have they been discussed with any potential development partners? And does it impact? Does it make getting a development partner easier or harder, depending on what what the local plan throws up? To? So generally, site allocations in the local plan come from a range of stakeholders. It could be residents suggesting sites for development, it could be the landowner themselves, or it could be the council saying this should be developed. Um, the ones in modern have come from previous consultations. So Abbotsford Triangle, and then our, our land and Tear Hills land, so it has come from that. We haven't specifically discussed those individual sites with development partners. We have discussed the wider town centre. So the town centre as a whole has been discussed with potential partners. Any more questions? Russell. The retail market in loads of high streets is not to do well at the moment and for all purposes focus say it's going to get worse. So what um, uh, criteria are you putting forward to, to select your retailers etc. Are they going to be food based? So, um, so in terms of the retail, we don't specifically have a criteria for retail yet. Um, that's what the work that Cushman and Wakefield are doing. Um, they're looking at the analysis of if it's retail based, what types of retailers will come to Morton. However, as we're probably all aware from the press, high streets are having a hard time. Successful high streets aren't always about retail, it's about workspaces, leisure, culture, all of that mix. So what we're planning in Morton is having the flexible space that could be any of those things in future. Um, with a long-term project we have to be flexible on this. Uh, but it's the Cushman and Wakefield retail work which will influence um, what we choose to do with the ground floor of those buildings. Um, question on the boundaries of this in terms of, you showed a map for the house and zone boundary, but I remember in previous years there was a, a wider more than town centre plan as part of uh, our area, as part of this regeneration, so uh, can you uh, quickly outline what is considered part of more than and part of this regeneration scheme? 
uh, we've had a lot of fun and games with the boundaries. Um, there is a wider town centre boundary in the local plan, which is the whole town centre, so frankly if there's a shop there, that's more than town centre. Mm. The red line here is what we will begin out for procurement with. Mm. So that there is a, a core development area, but there is a wider town centre. Um, obviously, as we go for a partner, we're not asking the development partner to build every inch of Morton. Uh, we're not looking to rebuild every inch of Morton either. However, principally, where the council owns land, uh, we've had to <coughs> draw that in the So this one here is the housing zone boundaries, what we will be procuring a partner for. Okay. Potentially, subject to all the consultation. Can we move on to the next one, um, which is uh, Merrington? Um, thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to stand up. If you can't hear me, just shout. So if you can't, I'm just going to start to shout. Then Paul will translate. So um, very much. Um, I'm James McGinley. The purpose of this presentation, I'm seconded to Merrington Developments. Uh, as part of my role, so I, I'm Managing Director of Grant and Development Limited um, for the purposes of this presentation. Um, what I'm going to do is take you through a presentation on basically the mechanics of the company, um, even more interesting, but it's the same number of presentation, Paul gets to do that, which is why we're we doing it, what we're we doing, and what's the purpose of the company in terms of a, a, a real provider of housing of choice. So, again, some of the squad are here, Damien's in the the, the uh, cheap seats, um, and um, Paul and myself are also um, part of the, the core team on random developments. It was established, correction, it was actually um, it was in the spring of 20, um, 2017 that um, random developments was established, approved by full council. Um, it's a company limited by shares, it's um, one of the companies that the council owns. Um, it's classified as a contracting authority, that's quite an important thing to be aware of. So, Although it's a private company, it's governed by the rules and regs as if it was a um, public body, so we have to owe you, we have to do all that kind of stuff. So it's not quite as fleet as a foot as the, the size of the company might indicate, but nevertheless, it's, um, it's one for it follows public, uh, public procurement. Um, and for the purposes of this, um, we're taking forward some council owned sites. You, um, we cover those um, in a bit more detail. But it's primarily for private rental accommodation. The council, when it was looking at establishing a company, sort of recognised that the housing market was changing and the private rental was becoming a more established choice in the market. It was an alternative to affordable accommodation and it was an alternative to outright ownership. Many of you may be familiar with generation rent. Um, so this was about how could, they, how, how, how could the council establish a company that provided a legitimate housing choice at the same time it's also helping mm -hmm. its revenue position. And to that um, aim, the Morantum Developments, one of its objectives is to be a housing provider of choice in the borough of Merton. We can do non-residential development, but it, we've really taken view that unless planning required that there's commercial activity, say it's a block of flats that required some workspace or retail on the ground floor as part of its planning permission, we wouldn't seek to do that unless it was, it was a planning obligation. So it's not part of our core objectives, it's not something that we would not do required. And it's, its objective is really to generate income for the council. It does that in two ways. It provides its shareholder with income through dividend payments, and it also borrows money from the council. The council will be the banker, and the council um, then benefits from the interest rate differential between what the council borrows at and what we, as a commercially focused company, do, which is private sector borrowing rates. So the council makes a return on its lending as well as on its um, dividend that the company receives from its, um, its rental or properties. Um, we move on. Um, it's important that the council, as a share, the sole shareholder, so does retain a lot of control over the company, but it sets it up with an objective to be commercially focused and to get on and develop housing. It's good, to, uh, as I say, mentioned it by way of dividend and interest rates. Um, and one of the important things I think is that the, the council has given the company the ability to go out and develop the housing, but it is strongly controlled. There's a shareholder <coughs> subcommittee that meets quarterly, that gets updates from the company in terms of its performance, and it's also that is the, the ability to make sure 
that the company is uh, delivering against the uh, business plan that's provided to the council when the company is approved, and indeed the company is obliged to update annually a business plan, get it approved by uh, the council, and therefore the shareholder subcommittee monitors the performance uh, each quarter against that business plan. <coughs> Traces of company's house. It's actually Marantum, not Marantum. Um, don't worry, everybody gets that wrong, including including me. It's got board of directors. Um, it's got a staff team that's responsible for the day-to-day -day management. And it's largely a, a commissioning company. We we're not we're not employing the architects director. We're not employing the planning advisors director. We're commissioning that through consultancy advice, as is common in the industry. Um, so it's got a small core team. It's 1.4 full-time equivalents, that's what belies the, the amount of activity that's going on below with the, in the water with the, the graceful spawn on the top, if I may refer to Damien. Um, <laughs> but it does bring an additional resource as and when uh, needed. And also what it, what it does is, like any company, it requires the policies in place for how it runs, whether that be human resources, whether that be finance, etc. And it buys those services in from the council, that commercial rate. And as I mentioned earlier, company will be um, borrowing the funding for development from the council. The council is able to borrow that at um, favourable rates from the public lands work board. Um, but the company is obliged to act commercially and therefore has to pay a commercially relevant interest rate when it borrows that money and the council benefits from the, the differential between its, its borrowing rate and the rate it gets from the, um, the company by way of a commercial loan. I'm going to hand over to Paul in terms of housing delivery. Um, <coughs> this is interesting, but I get the I get the bureaucracy. Paul gets the interesting bit. I'll just get the maps in the techie bit. Um, so the objective of Morantin really is to develop small council sites. It's ones where they never probably would have attracted a lot of major developers, um, but they're in neighbourhoods where you know, a bit of investment really um, would lift lift the market. Um, so Morantin really is focused on um, three types of housing really. The bulk of it is private rent. Um, the reason we've gone for that is fundamentally it brings a revenue return back to the council. And if I give an example of that, if the council had just sold land, you sell it once and you get money in once. Um, if we build flats to rent, the revenue comes back every year to the council and that's what the business model is based on. <clears throat> we are able to sell properties as well. Um, so for example, not for this first phase, but in future phases we, we may want to sell some to recoup the construction costs. Uh, but for the moment, because they're quite small sites, we are just looking at um, private rent. Um, in terms of affordable, uh, as many of you will know, the council is not a stock owning authority because we transferred housing stock to Clarion in 2010. Therefore, Morantin is not allowed to be a council housing provider or social housing provider. So what we have to do is, when we build it, we will sell those properties on to a housing association um, as part of the planning permission. So that's how the affordable housing will be provided. Um, the aim really is to deliver, we said fully sustainable communities. Um, this is a new housing offer um, for the neighbourhoods which we're looking to build in. But it's areas where we know the rental market is strong. I mean, in fact, there's not a lot of places in London you can rent a flat. Um, but um, what we're looking to do here is professionalise the rental offer. I think everyone's had subdivided flats, but that's where private rent tends to be. There is more professional approach to this now. Uh, there's a lot of big players in, in town. Uh, but for me, really, we're, because we know the area, we know the local markets, and we know the planning system, uh, we really hope to deliver some quality developments in the neighbourhood, which can be exemplar for small sites in London. So generally, uh, the first tranche uh, for our business plan, uh, there are four sites, and we look to deliver approximately 77 years. That will change, which I'll explain shortly. Um, so the first four sites are Elm Nursery Car Park, just north of the Mitcham Town Centre, and Raleigh Gardens Car Park in Mitcham. Um, now this doesn't mean Mitcham doesn't have any car parking, there's a huge multi-storey that's always empty. Um, and there's new car parking we put into Mitcham to rediscover Mitcham, um, so actually we know there's um, no shortage of spaces, but there is a demand for housing. Um, the other ones, um, there's land um, adjacent to Cannons. Um, we're really engaged in the local community on that one, but it sits adjacent to the Cannons HLF project. Um, very beautiful, but very sensitive site. Uh, that actually uh, could work with the Cannons because actually having people living there is informal surveillance um, and actually having activity in the park with help. Uh, the other one is a former church hall on the farm road mob, uh, so kind of St. Helen area. 
Mm. So as you can see, they're not dead set or turn center sites. Uh, they're not dead on the cheap line, but actually they're, they're, they're at a very reasonable price point in the market, which is why we selected them, as well as them being coastal. Mm. So I, I said that the housing figures, um, 77 units, was indicative at the moment. That's because we are just currently procuring the design planning um, consultants. Once they get into the detail of designing the sites, we might get more out of some sites, we might get less, depending on the housing mix. So that's why it's indicative at the moment. Um, but this just gives you a flavour. You know, they're not huge developments, they're, they're actually quite humble uh, for the sites that they're on and, and this is the neighbourhood that they're in. Um, in terms of procurement, James mentioned, um, although it is a private company, we are um, a contracting authority, so we, we will abide by the public sector rules. Um, so that's, that's already started um, as we put the tenders out six weeks ago for the planning and design work. Uh, we are also looking to separate the design and building elements of the work. Now the reason for that is we want to retain an element of control over design quality. Um, we don't just want to pass everything out to one contractor and let them go on with it. Um, we also, because of council sites, the, the land isn't transferred to the Morantum yet. They are subject to planning. Uh, now the housing market may change, uh, economics may change as we get into this uh, and into next year certainly. So we have the ability to do design and planning, pause and check that the business plan still works for Moranton and the council and then proceed to build it. So that there are checks and balances all the way through. Uh, in terms of Moranton Development Limited, uh, we want to ensure a high level build quality. Um, we will be holding on to these units, uh, the business plans assume in 30 years, we need really robust well maintainable apartments. They are the ones where we just build and sell them. We will be looking after these, <coughs> therefore the ongoing maintenance, the fixtures and fittings have to be a much higher spec early on and we've built that into the spec already. Uh, we also want to minimise the construction time. Um, I think quite often a lot of people in planning you see big developments which is a little bit more than, but these are 20 units per site, they're quite quick to build. Um, we don't have to be experimental with the building construction because it just has to be robust and good quality and that's what we're planning. Uh, so that's how we can maintain control of the timeline. Um, that's what I touched on, traditional construction really. Um, so Moranton Development Limited, uh, we're responsible for the design and planning uh, and the site due diligence. So that's like the geotechnical, the archaeological surveys, all of that is underway at the moment. Uh, we will overall control the design um, and then there'll be a separate contract probably around July next year we'll, we'll begin to put the construction contract out. Uh, we've set out our requirements. Um, one of the things we are holding on to is we're going to have the same cost consultant through the architecture and design process and the build process. So we have that consistency um, of the consultancy team. Um, ultimately, Morantin will be submitting the planning applications to the council, but that will be via um, our planning engagements. So, so generally, it's a, it's a two stage process so that we can check um, that all the still makes financial sense before we actually put it straight into the ground. Uh, we have conducted some soft market testing, um, so that helped us define what the procurement routes were. Um, it, it is likely to promote small contractors and small architect practices. We think that's right, we want to champion small business, um, given the scale and nature of these sites, um, if that makes sense. However, we also have to make sure that actually small Morantin's business is all about 20% of a small practice's business. Um, <clears throat> if it was any more, we don't want to be one person's only job. Um, and we also want to have the confidence that the developers, sorry the builders, um, have an understanding of the PRS product. Uh, PRS is private rent and I think what I meant by that is the maintenance and how you service these buildings is different to normal houses. Um, so we need developers to understand that. Um, in terms of procurement, uh, the design procurement is underway. We put that on the tender portal six weeks ago. Um, those tenders come back in Friday next week. So we will be beginning to assess them shortly. Uh, we'll get to appoint the design team in January and we've made a commitment to do early pre-app consultations with local communities before we actually finalise any of the designs. <coughs> it's going to be an architect-led design team um, and that's to ensure quality controls so therefore all the cost consultants and engineers they will sit under mm -hmm. the architect team. Um, we don't yet know whether we'll have one designer for four sites or we'll have one for each site. That is going to come out in the wash of the, when we look at the tenders next week. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, generally, we're looking to commence the 
construction procurement from uh, the details in May. So that's going to be just towards the tail end of the planning process. <coughs> so in summary, um, we have defined the product specification for the apartments and the sites. Um, the de design team procurement is underway at the moment. Uh, that will conclude in January where we hope to appoint the design team. Uh, there is due diligence surveys going on at the moment with the sites. So that's like the um, archaeological surveys, right to light, all of that is underway at the moment. Uh, the design and planning, that really won't start until January and we, we've built in six months. I mean, it's maybe you no know, planning should be 12 weeks, but it's always a bit longer. We want to build in time uh, for community engagement as well. So it's going to be about a six month process. Uh, and then we'll start the procurement of the construction in May, between May and October. But that's the ones we have a bit of certainty about the planning. <coughs> um, so with the fair winds, we're looking for applying approvals around January. It's a 2018, it's 2019. Um, <coughs> uh, and then again, I said the deal with the land isn't subject to planning. So there'll be negotiations with the American Council around the land transfers in the summer next year. We hope to start construction around this time next year. Um, and then October 2020 for completions. Um, the bill period for snagging and testing um, as handover before actually letting the properties from the government in 2020. Uh, this fits in with the business plan, which is said that American Council will start getting um, <coughs> income back in from 2021. So we've just that slack in this already. Um, I'll conclude it there, but we're happy to take any questions from the panel. Have there been any delays in the establishment of Moransing so far? Yeah. In terms of the establishment, no. The, um, I think what there have been some delays in is, is the, the set-up of some of the activities. So although the company was established, um, the team was established, probably some of the activities, particularly around the nature of the procurement, took longer than was anticipated. And, and has that changed the, um, the date at which you expect the revenue stream to, to come in at all? The, the, the revenue scheme is probably slipped by about six months. Um, with all the, anything that's got a construction programme, there's a level of contingency, there's all this put in there, a level of contingency remains. Um, and you know, we, we aim to be um, <coughs> doors in 2020. Um, question on design. Um, you, you keep mentioning that you want to go to planning applications early in the new year and or towards something and get approval and start next year building work. But uh, design is one of those very speculative things that different people have different views on. Um, have you thought about how you liaise with people here in the council and about that and also the planning committee? So it would be very embarrassing if you came with a design and the committee decided to over overturn it because that will make all of our lives a bit of a misery. So do you have a strategy how to loop us in as it were on design to, to help you achieve your aims? Let's say that you're in, for the purpose of, of this presentation, we'll call ourselves up to declare that we, we're not officers of the council when we're doing this, we, we, um, and you have to play a, a very straight battle on that. Um, it's an objective of the, the company that it produces a very good quality product, and therefore part of that is that it has a very good quality of design because it's part of the success of the business model. Um, when we refer to design, we're referring to interior design. That's particularly important in the private rental market because it is a slightly different product to, to one one might buy you know, you're purchasing uh, uh, off in a block of flats. But also we are aware that some of these are in sensitive areas and therefore it's absolutely incumbent upon us as a company to ensure that we get the highest quality of, of design. We want to have pre-application meetings with uh, council officers. We want to ensure that we have good and robust consultation with local residents. We also want to ensure that we employ good quality architects um, to do that. Um, we need to make sure we get the balance between quality and cost correct. But I think the business model stands on the quality of the development and therefore we need to make sure that from the get-go that's an underlying principle. So I think that's the reassurance we want to give the property and quality it goes to planning applications committee. Is as important for the company in terms of its business model as it is in securing a planning approval. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned shareholders. Uh, it might be good for the benefit of the committee if you uh, clarified who those are and and if uh, what oversight and direction they give you, because uh, I understand that uh, their meetings can last as short as about four minutes. So the um, shareholder. Uh, the council is a shareholder, um, 
There is a board of management development which is made up of um, directors who oversee the operation of the company which is primarily focused at the moment in terms of getting the procurement underway and getting the construction built and by necessity that those are regular meetings which are monthly to, to update progress against that. In terms of governance from the council's perspective, I think it's probably best that I hand over to the shareholder representative who's christening. So the, the shareholder subcommittee is made up of the leader of the council, uh, the deputy leader of the council and the cabinet member for uh, housing and regeneration. Um, I act as the representative of the shareholders on the officer side and the meetings have been short uh, largely because we're at the stage of the uh, company's formation which doesn't require a great deal of decision making. Um, I think that will change over time uh, but fortunately it's uh, brief and business like at present. I think the other thing I'll just add is that they, um, there are a number of the matters are actually um, it's, it's clear in the articles of the company what's the company's responsibility and what are reserved to the shareholder and therefore elements like delegation of um, spend limits etc. A large amount of that is contained within the, the company's um, articles and therefore it doesn't require shareholder approval at this point. When we actually get to the point of appointing um, con consultants for design and construction etc then there will be more um, information required to the shareholder subcommittee by way of um, governance. One more question. Um, I would like to know about the process of identifying sites you've earmarked for. Is there any particular reason why they, those four came to the forefront rather than anywhere else in the borough? And um, do you have initial ideas what, what you might do in subsequent years? Um, when, the, um, when the council approved the, um, the operation or uh, the setting up and operation of um, Rantan Development Limited. Um, these sites were chosen primarily because they were clear, clear sites and ready to go. And um, in part of the analysis that, the, that was done prior to approval was seeking the advice, particularly of, of local agents, as to whether or not these were attractive locations for the private rental market. So, with that reassurance, those sites were brought forward. That the um, paper that it went to full council for approval had a list of a number of other sites that were in council ownership um, at various stages of uh, planning designation or um, their uh, site availability. Um, those ones will be developed further. Um, there are, there have been no new sites introduced into that list, but you know the, the pipeline of the, of, the, of the company was to um, be in a position to um, work with the council to develop out all of those sites. Could be as much as seventeen hundred units. If, of, of all the sites we use, but I hasten to add that is a objective rather than a requirement of the council uh, of the company. Um, just following on from that point, it might be a question from the council's perspective actually. Um, in terms of potential sites, um, are there conversations and maybe a, a longer term relationship in, in terms of Brampton's relationship with the council and the council relationship with Clary on looking at? Central sites. Is there potentially a conflict there, and and what would your the council's priorities be in those in those terms? Um, so I'm not too sure there's a conflict. There's potential for uh, us both to be interested in the same sites. Clarion have got their own business objectives. Uh, they're principally around how they deliver their regeneration schemes. That they've already got approval for, uh, and the demands placed upon them will be for how they, with regard to how they get the decant sites to kickstart um, <coughs> those schemes. So they will need to identify additional sites within the borough um, in order to rehouse those uh, tenants, in order to progress those schemes. Most of that has been secured, but I suspect uh, they may well wish to look for additional sites. So sites that the council has in its ownership may be attractive to Clary, uh, are also attractive to Maranton. The council's role is to ensure that for any site, any asset that we have, we secure best consideration uh, and we will need to develop a, uh, a mechanism, a model, whereby we assess what Maranton can deliver in terms of a return to the council through uh, rent, uh, through dividend and through interest payments compared to what the council could get if it was to sell that site on the open market to Clarion or any other organisation um, through auction, through private sale. 
So we will have that model, we'll develop it to ensure that uh, we test out the robustness of Morantum's business case, what they can deliver, uh, what, how quickly they can deliver it, uh, and what the dividend would be to the council, and compare and contrast that with other uh, competing potential bids that we may have, so that we can ensure that the council taxpayer gets the best possible return. Um, in the future, um, if, if all this works, is the is Morenton going to be in a position to, to buy sites? So, or is it just um, council sites that we're always going to be looking at? Well, we, we hope it will be a success, and there's every reason why it, it will be a success because many other authorities have invested in housing companies of this type which are successful. It will be able to buy sites only if the council lends the company money to do that. Uh, and I've come back to my earlier point that that will be a function of um, the sites that it wishes to acquire, the business case that it presents to the council uh, as shareholder, uh, which requires the loan of uh, money to the company to invest in that land and to build it out. Uh, and we'll want to test the robustness of that business case uh, before the council invests further money. Uh, but the signs are very positive so far, uh, so I hope we get to that point. Okay, thank you for that. Just a question for the house about the home um, nursery. Um, as you all know now, it has been used as a very popular car park for businesses within that area. Um, you, would you be looking at any area that can be used for car parking? for businesses. For instance, we have the doctor's surgery across the road. We have um, you know, many businesses in the area that use a car park. And I mean, I live in that area for 28 years, so I have quite a good knowledge about what happened and what will happen um, where um, parking spaces are concerned. Uh, is there any, any area that you look at that can use for parking space so we don't get too congested with having car park Anywhere and anywhere. So the, uh, the, the, the company who puts some its planning application will have to provide a you know transport analysis and like any other planning application would and demonstrate how it's going to deal with any of those issues. What I would say is that um, the, the sites that um, the, the Ransom Development Limited is, is looking to build out are ones that have always been earmarked for um, development, either um, in the current local plan or indeed historically they've been carried over from many iterations of previous plans um, and therefore um, there always has been intention to develop those so we'd have to, as a company, we would seek to make sure that we were able to provide the, the transport information in terms of the site um, but I think it, was, it is something that we are aware that, um, as, uh, that in the de dealing with that, that um, it wouldn't necessarily be the company's um, role to provide alternative ac um, parking accommodation um, but it was also also looked to make sure that it, it worked favourably with its neighbour its neighbours. Thank you very much, James, for the and Paul for your presentations. We're going to perform this monitoring now. <laughs> Time around, we're um, doing the performance monitoring slightly differently. I'll give it to Nick to. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I can confirm that I met with Council Officers Anthony Hopkins, Graham Close, and Julie Regan on Monday, the 29th of October, to discuss the performance monitoring indicators. If I begin with community and housing, housing need for needs figures, page 77. As noted at the last meeting, the service has seen an increase in client as a result of the Housing Reduction Act, but this hasn't impacted on performance. Officers continue to monitor this closely. I also inquired if there was an identifiable link between homelessness and the rollout of universal credit and merging. The relevant officer responded by confirming there is not. The main cause of homelessness in the borough is the ending of short-term tenancies. Library visitor figures, SP480, page 77, are still below the challenging target, but numbers are up 20,000 on last year. 
The adjustment to the figures as highlighted from the previous performance indicators has now been corrected. Moving on to environment and regeneration, our regulatory services, SP041, page 79, percentage of service requests responded to within five days. Underperformance is exasperated by the inclusion of FOI requests and member inquiries alongside. I recommend that these are removed from the measure next year to achieve a better understanding of service request performance. CRP 048, page 80. Street cleaning inspection sites surveyed on local street inspections for litter that are below standard. This is a monthly indicator, is at 16.43%, which is more than twice the 8% target. CRP 093 on page 80, missed refuge collection figures are at a staggering two and a half times the target. CRP 094, page 80, fly tipping has increased, partly due to actual increase and partly due to better reporting. However, the borough is on course for over 10,000 fly tipping incidents in the year. On page 80, SP 139, Sites surveyed below the standard for weeds quarterly is at 16.05%, well above the 11% target. This could also be worse, with the streets being given a B- rating, despite not being free of weeds, due to the definitions in the Contractual Performance Management System gradings, which can be found on page 73. Graham Close uh, confirmed that there will be the usual November and December grace period for the removal of leaves, leaves from the borough's streets and therefore this should be completed by the new year. This is one to watch for the panel to watch for, at our next meeting. And finally, uh, resident survey satisfaction measures, page 80, recommend, re I recommend that more challenging annual targets are set. Current annual targets are SP262, resident satisfaction with recycling facilities, 72%. SP064, Resident Satisfaction with Refuge Collection, 73%. SP269, Resident Satisfied with Street Cleaning, 57%. And on page 81, Satisfaction with Parks and Grease Paces, the target is set at 76%. Thank you. Um, well, I, I noted all the comments. I think the comments with regard to the environmental health indicators are very helpful, um, so that we can look to remove the uh, uh, the FOI requests and to make that performance indicator clearer. I think you're right to focus on the Veolia performance areas, which are depressing, really, in terms of the level of performance that's reported here. And we are in a um, a period of significant change. Um, and I've, I've said it before, and just to reassure the, the panel uh, this evening, that um, we are absolutely vigilant in terms of our attention to this particular contract because it is a significant factor in you know, the quality of people's lives. Uh, and we are um, performance managing the contract, whilst at the same time working alongside Veolia to ensure that the mobilisation of the service goes as smoothly as possible. And so far, by and large, the mobilisation of the service change has gone better than expected. Um, and we have taken all of the lessons that have been learned from Sutton's experience and other authorities uh, and worked those through reasonably successfully so far. There are some areas where it's still to be resolved in terms of bins, uh, and, bins and receptacles that still need to be delivered. <clears throat> but the early signs are that it is having an impact on street cleanliness, as verified by Graham Close in his inspection so far. And we also expect, expect that the figures in terms of recycling levels will show uh, an upturn in terms of the amount that's uh, going to recycling. We've already seen that Croydon a month ahead, We've seen Croydon's recycling performance go from 38 to 45 in the first month. Our figures aren't available for probably another week or two yet, um, but we expect to see a similar upturn in terms of the recycling levels, which is why, we've going, why we're going through all this pain, to get cleaner streets, uh, to get that recycling improvement, uh, and to reduce the cost of the service. So, uh, we've already benefited from the reduced cost of the service. 
the other two benefits are in the pipeline and we hope uh, we'll be able to report more positively on those uh, in the new year. Uh, but just to reassure you, we are uh, absolutely vigilant in terms of the uh, <coughs> approach that we're taking to work closely with Vialia uh, to embed this contract uh, and go through this very significant change successfully. Thank you. On the Vialia contract, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's very, very clear that Vialia is struggling on all performance measures. But with the service rollout, there's a couple of um, patterns that are becoming evident. Uh, I think one is uh, bins not being returned to residents' properties, and I think the other is the difficulties in, in ensuring that recollections and additional collections actually happen. And it's certainly something that fills up my case workload. Uh, I wondered if there were any ways of measuring those uh, those developing patterns and adding them into the performance uh, statistics that we look at. So bins that aren't returned to the property, there is actually a, uh, a drop-down menu on the council's website which allows a resident to report that it hadn't been returned. Um, so if that's followed, we should be able to keep an accurate record uh, of those. Uh, and we are already raising such instances with Vialia in order to ensure that those are corrected. Um, sorry, I didn't pick up the second so point. So the, um, the organisation of recollections and additional collections, so where um, collection is missed for whatever reason, yeah. what we've noticed is that uh, that's often on the online systems recorded as not presented correctly, which the resident often denies. But nonetheless, if we then forward through to the public space team, um, they organise, kindly organise for us a recollection, those recollections are just not happening um, and there doesn't seem to be any ability to force Veolia to do it, they just get picked up two weeks later. Um, and that does seem to be the thing, a pattern, and I wondered if there's any way of, of us measuring and monitoring that. I don't know whether Anita's got any detail on that. No, I don't have the actual detail, but I'm aware of the situation that the Catholic is describing. And it's certainly something that we're raising with the owner. Is it possibly something to do with the seniority of officers dealing with it? I mean, they, they do seem to be just getting ignored, the, the NCOs. No, I mean, it's being escalated. It's, you know, they're raising it in their regular meetings with them. In fact, we have daily conversations with them. Uh, and we're myself and Charlie are involved in those as well. Um, but in addition, it's also being raised at the some kind of contract meetings uh, which involve a broader partnership. And just to reassure you on that, I mean, this is, this is being done with at a very senior level. So, mm -hmm. Anita and I sit in on a 9 a.m. and a 4 p.m. meeting mm -hmm. where we have a conference call with Veolia in order to pick up just the sorts of issues that you're describing. Now, some of those are anecdotal and some of those are backed up by more evidence where we've got volumes of calls through the customer contact centre and details of the requests that are coming through the CRM system. And we are in a degree of turbulence where a system is still being bedded in. But over time, what we're seeing is that those are being resolved. The volume of calls has gone down significantly. The number of referrals through the website has gone down significantly. The number of complaints, and there have been complaints, are going down. And so we are getting through this. Um, it'll probably take another month or so till we get through to the end of it. But it is getting much better. And certainly is a million miles away from the experience that we've seen in Sutton. Um, so I think we are... Uh, getting there, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than I expected to be from. Right, I want to follow up from what the Councillor Fairclough was saying. My, um, my query is on the rollout and the immersion patterns. Um, the main immersion pattern is in parts of Wimbledon on the hill, particularly hillside, but also parts of Village and Mains Park. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation from Veolia or a lot of bad data. Um, and, and recording of types of property incorrectly um, and then we find out that properties can get missed despite we being told that they were going to be collected. There's been a severe issue with, in my world in particular of, of flats and what's, what's described as a communal collection or, or not and, um, and the fact that we only kept telling us everything was fine and then I get probably hundreds of emails a week on this um, Clearly, there is an emerging problem where we've, you know, we've feeding this in. We've been told something's been fixed, and then lo and behold, we've been ignored. So, so what I want to tease out is why is Veolia kind of misleading some of us by saying 
you know, officers say it's been sorted, but then actually on the ground it hasn't. And I think that's been an emerging problem. And the fact that they've ignored the issue of flats despite me warning them in various committee meetings over the last year or so. So uh, they're not here to defend themselves, but what I would say is that I don't get the sense that they're deliberately misleading anybody. I think they are going through a very significant change, which requires you know almost every household in the borough to receive new receptacles and to change their method of waste collection and presentation, uh, and that has caused some some teething problems. Uh, we're working through those on a daily, diligent basis uh, in order to rectify them. So. If there are specific addresses, um, pass them through, and I know you've passed those through. We'll deal with them as quickly and as efficiently as we can, and I'm sure the earlier seek to as well. Because they don't, I'm sure if they were here, they would say they don't want to be leaving properties without the, the appropriate refuse collection, storage and collection arrangements. Those things are only going to come back and, uh, and cause um, anxiety, concern and reputational damage. Do you have anything to say? Luxury, you know me for 30 years, so you know I'm never short for something to say. <laughs> um, I've been having regular meetings myself with the director and his team, and even um, had a meeting. I asked for um, Scott Edgell and his um, manager to come in and speak to us after 10 days into the um, the rollout because it seemed that there were some issues with what they were telling us and what they have admitted is that their systems fell down so that I don't think there was any deliberate lying or misleading uh, of us in the early stages uh, it did lead to a backlog in delivery of containers of all sorts wheelie bins uh, initially but now uh, other containers they are working on that and they're trying to get through that uh, I'm watching the information closely, um, but I, I would would say that with half in excess of half a million collections per month, and that's the scale of a refuse collection operation for a borough this size, in excess of half a, a million containers a month collected. Um, it has, for those where it's not gone well, it is significant for those individuals, but for the vast majority of the borough it has gone smoothly and we have calls to the call centre that are now in the 400s per day uh, with a waiting time of three or four minutes on average uh, and that is um, just at the end of the, the first month of operation. Uh, it was peaking at the beginning, there were 1800 calls uh, on environmental issues to start with but the normal call rate will be 300 to 350 for the environmental uh, services type calls through to the call centre. So I'm encouraged by that um, and I, I visit the call centre weekly to just to, to get a catch up on what the flavour of what they're saying is uh, and people are, um, you know, they're, they're dealing with the issues and it is coming down. So I am optimistic over the next month that we will see a further in improvement in that. Uh, the streets are cleaner, I believe. It means that I can really start pushing with officers as well as we've heard from Pat to Jesus is to start to work on the fly tipping. Uh, issue because once we've removed all the accidental debris and we heard from the tidy um, Britain campaign that 50% of our street refuse or litter was down to our method of collection so once that's gone we can really then start to work on the rest and motor on that so I'm optimistic but I'm not complacent uh, so I do keep pushing and asking the questions uh, as they come through I think that what's clear is that there was some there's some things that, that Veolia were not quite aware of and that does, is around some of the flats things and we're discussing that uh, where there was mis -collect, mi mixed collections. Some flats were having a, a um, flat type collection for one source of waste and a domestic collection for the others and that's caused some hiccups in those areas but we are talking to Veolia about that to iron that out as well. So, okay. Just a comment to follow up. Um, a lot of these problems were known about, forewarned, and uh, I painted a picture of this apocalypse back in various council meetings and scrutiny meetings over the last year, and I did highlight uh, the issue of flats. Um, so there was plenty and ample time to get this prepared, and Veolia have somewhat failed, and it's a lot of 
and we residents out there I and mean, I get it in the neck and I make sure I lay the blame at your door, no offence, but well not your door but Council Alan Brittis's door, uh, ever since he was famously on the, on the, uh, on, on the media saying that, uh, it's all good and everything, everybody's got their bins already, uh, when we all know that wasn't true, so, so um, I, I lay the blame with him because you know, that's where it duly lies. Any more questions? Oh, come on. Random one on a different topic. Um, different topic, just to be fair. Um, I'm looking at one of the indicators on air quality, something that I like to talk about occasionally. And if I just find it, uh, it's on page 79, SP 494. Um, it seems like there's a rather large number of sites failing on NOx. I mean, is this number correct or? I mean, it's, it seems rather high, and it's got a red indicator. Um, what, are you, what are you doing about it? Is it correct, and what are you doing about it to try and reduce the problem? So, it is correct, um, and what we're doing about it is delivering the air quality action plan, uh, which happy to bring back to members in due course. Um, as we like to occasionally give some recommendations, I uh, thought I'd quickly just offer one up to the committee to see what you think that we could recommend to either officers or cabinet. Um, some, of the, some of the targets we don't think are particularly challenging or high enough. For instance, uh, ones Nick highlighted, such as SP262 resident satisfaction with recycling. Uh, that, that, that target's at, at 72%. Um, we think that's rather low. Same with satisfaction with refuse collection, 73%, and street cleanliness, we only, uh, the target that the council wants to achieve is 57%. What I w w want to uh, make a reference back is saying that we want more aspirational higher targets to meet because this is a key concern for residents and we, uh, we want to set higher targets and expect the council to try and meet it. Kind of meet a very easy target, it doesn't seem like a, a good thing in my opinion. So the reference is increase the, these targets or these particular indicators. I can put that in the form of words afterwards for, for Stella to record in the minutes. Can I, sorry, can I just ask on that point, is there any history of where the targets have been before, like in comparison, obviously I'm more from improving the targets we aim for. That's why I know the history as well, to, to have context to that. So the, the, the targets are set based upon previous history. Uh, and comparable other local authority uh, performance on these, and they are benchmarkable. Uh, it's an annual resident survey, and it's carried out in a number of London boroughs. Um, the problem with setting aspirational targets is unless you back them up with significant uh, service change and cash in order to drive and achieve them, it's only ever going to be aspirational. Uh, far better, in my advice, to set a target that is realistic, uh, stretchy, but realistic, based upon uh, the authority's priorities, uh, what we're doing to change performance, uh, and how we compare with other boroughs. We do know that we've invested a significant amount of energy into changing the borough's recycling arrangements, and we expect that to improve the satisfaction. It may not improve this year, because residents' perception of the recycling performance will be coloured by their experience of the mobilisation and the service change. And uh, whatever we think about the aspirations of the recycling arrangement, some residents may have been confused and uh, found it not to their liking. I think it will take a year to settle down, and I think we will see a significant improvement in resident satisfaction with recycling arrangements. Probably not this year round, but another year. But I suppose I'm moving off the general point, which is these targets are not set uh, on, a, on a whim or just with a finger in the air. They are based on historical trends, based upon the investment that we're putting in to improve services and set in the context of comparison with other comparable boroughs. Any comments? Yeah, just to Sorry, can I have some clarification of where those talks were before? I mean, I'm new to this committee, so I haven't seen them myself. But so I can't remember the numbers, but they've, oh, yeah. they've all improved. And we are, you know, when you see the annual resident survey results, 
which are reported annually to, uh, to council. As as we, we are, you know, we are amongst the best in, in, in London on most indicators and comparability uh, in terms of value for money and the quality of services. I can't recall where, where those particular indicators have been. Okay. I have to say, I always find when you say we, we want to be in comparison to another borough, you know, we want to be better than other boroughs. I just, I, I always find that, but I hate to use this word, but I think it's a bit weak, really, to say, well, everyone else is this good, so we're going to be that good. Well, we've got to be a bit more ambitious than that. Perhaps when we suggest a, and I take on your point with regard to the recycle, the, the new uh, waste uh, disposal system we've put in place, but we would have a rolling incremental increase that will then take into account the, the bedding down, but will ensure that um, we are trying to be better. And frankly, residents satisfied with street cleanliness, 57%. That's low. So, to, just to reassure you, through the chair, um, I, I, I wouldn't mean to suggest that we aren't aiming to be better than the London boroughs, but we do take that comparability across London of you know, where are London boroughs performing. If the bulk of London boroughs are performing, say, 50%, uh, and everyone's in a sort of 40 to 60, there is no point of setting a target of 90% because it's clear that perceptions uh, will not get to that level, no matter what you do almost. So comparability with the London Borough sets at least the context, whilst we also want to be the best in whatever field we're operating in. <coughs> and I suppose if we set um, higher targets, that has cost implications on the on the delivery of the services. Well, you, you can set the target at whatever level you like. If you actually aim to achieve it, you're going to have to put some money into it uh, in order to to deliver that level of performance. Because uh, you know the, the delivery of those targets is often, not always, is often a function of how much resource, how much a priority is it for you, and how much you're going to put into it. Not always, but sometimes. Um, Following up on the, on the chair's question, really, if we if we request changing the targets, will that result in any change to um, what what Merton does? And secondly, and um, hopefully, if uh, this change is going to bring about positive improvement, actually a rolling increase in some of these performance targets sounds like a good idea because um, Merton believes that things are going to get better. Um, in which case, we should be pushing ourselves a bit hard. I think. I mean, what I don't want to uh, do is, is mislead um, the panel into thinking that we aren't ambitious. Um, but what I don't equally want to do is just set targets for the sake of um, seeking to show that we are aspirational without backing it up with the appropriate work. And um, we're not in a position this evening just to pluck numbers out of the air and to set them against these particular indicator sets. The, the, the targets are set based upon a high degree of analysis and interpretation of what are we doing, what are the others doing, what's the direction of travel, uh, where do, what's a stretch beyond what we think we can already achieve. Um, I'm happy for, for obviously for the, for the panel to reflect on where you think the target should be and I can advise you as to whether that's realistic or not. Um, and whether that's uh, likely to be achieved. Uh, the service plans will be in front of you in January so that you can look at the targets that are being set at that point and maybe reflect on whether you think those are uh, realistic or aspirational enough. Mike, do you want to have Kevin to say that now? Just a, a, a thing on street cleanliness, which is something I'm passionate about, always have been passionate about, but you must remember we're dealing with the poor behaviour residents and people who pass through the borough when it comes to street cleanliness. Uh, and so we can do all we want in terms of sweeping the streets unless we couple that with educating people and uh, and just try to to, uh, to change the way people view them. Every time, nearly every day I walk into my road at night coming out from work, there's a bag of dogs with two cups next to it, which is clearly where someone goes and chooses to park after work, have their supper with their friends, um, and then just leave it at the side of the road. I could get as angry as I want to about that. It's not Merton's fault. It is those people who do it. So we need to be more challenging, uh, so, and so therefore raising targets 
comes with a cost implication. Whether it's enforcement, more sweepers, or more education, more whatever, to get rid of it. So we need to work together. But I think, um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I do agree with, uh, with a lot of that, but I think what Nick was also alluding to was that in some areas, a half the street is clean sweet. Is that right, if I... But, but um, Graham Close highlighted with regard to the... Um, yeah, the... the uh, where are we? <coughs> Lost. Okay, yes, indeed, with the um, the uh, contractual performance management system, which actually is ID Verdi's section, so it appears on page 73. Um, look, it's the definition of, of how many weeds, are, as it was explained to me, that you could have a street that uh, has got no weeds on one side of it, weeds on the other, um, and it gets a B minus when it could have been a C, and that figure then would have been higher. So again, we just seem to have indicators that you get a pass mark for doing half a job. Um, and so, like, well, maybe there's just some definitions. If you look on page 73, yeah, it's very uh, bland. In fact, it's, it's really down to interpretation. I mean, it's a bit deja vu, really, isn't it? You know, we've had ID Verdi earlier today talking about their, their presentation. Um, we know that uh, Croydon has just, or it has ended their contract um, as of January. Uh, so, you know, these companies are not performing. Um, and I'm not blaming them, putting it at the offices or the, the yes, they have. Uh, yeah. Nick, did you have something to say? But, but, uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say something very, very brief about uh, satisfaction targets, because satisfaction targets are. Uh, they're not immeasurable. I mean, they, 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 you can ask people whether they're satisfied or not, but it, it, it's just it's perception. If, you, if, if it's kind of the, num the total amount of waste per household, for instance, that's immeasurable. Uh, that, that's where we can actually try to affect an improvement. It's very, very e easy uh, using things like social media to get people incredibly dissatisfied with something that's actually pretty good. Uh, we've all had experience of that on our, on our social media accounts. And, uh, you know, Realistically, the, the, I would have thought, from, from my position, the ones that I'm most interested in are the ones where I can actually see what has been done, what has been achieved, rather than by well, how, how, how happy people are, you know, are, are from one day to the next. Obviously, I want everybody to be happy. It would be great if they were. And our figures <coughs> are, as we've already said, not bad at all. But, uh, but it's the measurable things that I want to see as a cabinet member. Yeah, I think... Are we probably doing a reference stack or not? No, um, personally, I think, I think having realistic um, targets is probably better than having targets that... But maybe we could keep an eye on it and, as they improve, have a look at the targets. Is that a recommendation that people would agree with? I don't know. That's just our normal goal. Hmm? That's just our normal goal, so... Yeah. I think, um, I mean, having listened to everyone, we are, um, at the moment, as we all know, you know, they have just gone through a feeding period, and I think we should um, give a bit more time and work alongside with officers do as much as we can, and then, of course, if we look into by now and maybe next year, January, I mean, things hasn't changed, it may sound a long time, but it's not very long, um, then we can, you know, set the target or something like that, but at the moment, I think we need to just, you know, give a bit more time and see what's happening. I mean, we have been going over this the whole evening, the same thing over and over again, but at the same time, you know, just we need to consider. Yeah, we'll come back. Okay. So, we'll come back in January. Yeah. So, yeah, no, we, we won't have reference to um, Cabinet, but we will look at it again in January or as they are uh, through the uh, new, in the coming meetings. But okay.
space protection. Thank you, Chair. I'll try and be brief, recognising that time is getting on. Um, for the benefit of the relatively new members to the panel um, at the equivalent meeting in 2017, I reported on some proposals for new public space protection order, specifically in relation to dog controls in the borough. And this report uh, is simply reporting on progress uh, in relation to that PSPO in the intervening time. And also on some other dog control initiatives that have been occurring during the, the, this past 12 months or so. Um, at, the point, th at this point last year, we actually just completed a borough-wide survey of people's views about dog controls and dog issues generally. Uh, I was pleased to report that we'd had over a thousand responses to that, but we didn't actually analyse the data at that stage. It was the, the, literally the, the consultation had just closed. Uh, so we, we subsequently did analyse the, the, the feedback from, from, from the community and some very clear findings emerged from that which we subsequently took to the Cabinet in January and later to Council in February and those proposals were, were, were approved. Just to remind uh, members of the panel what those were, uh, there were four measures uh, in total. The first being the prohibition of dog family by ensuring that dog owners and walkers clear up after their dogs, which commonly is known as poop scooping. The second was the establishment of dog exclusion areas, and those are specific features within parks, for example, such as children's playgrounds and ball courts, where dogs would not be permitted. Uh, so I should have said that actually the first was supported by 90, the, the poop scooping was supported by 98.5% of those responded. The second about dog exclusion areas was, eight, was about 87 percent of those who responded to the survey. Um, a third one was to, that dog be put on a lead in public places when directed to do so by an authorised officer, a police officer, or a community support officer. That was supported by 76 percent, 76.5 percent of the of, of respondents. And finally, that the maximum number of dogs that can be walked by any one person in all public open spaces at any one time is four. I hope that made sense. Uh, so four dogs per person in reality. Uh, and 70% of respondents supported that. Um, the drafting of the PSPO has been further developed since that time. Uh, we had uh, we were mindful of uh, a legal challenge that occurred to a similar PSPO in the London Borough of Richmond. That challenge was ultimately uh, unsuccessful, but during that phase we suspended progress uh, to understand uh, uh, and, and to gauge the changes that, that, that might be made to make the dog control PSPO a much more viable instrument going forward. Uh, and subsequently some changes were made to the draft as a consequence. So following that, we've um, uh, compiled lists of sites, maps of individual sites, including things like the dog exclusion areas. Um, and the, the final task to be done is a slightly more challenging one compared to dog control, uh, the previous dog control uh, system that was in place. That covered the entire borough with the exclusion of Wimbledon Common, which has its own controls. The, the new PSPO has to be has to detail and map the individual sites that are concerned, so that's the one outstanding task that has to be done. So once officers are content with the revised uh, draft PSPO and all the schedules that go with that, and subject to the approval of the Director of Environment and Regeneration and, and the Cabinet Member for Community and Culture, the PSPO will be sealed, signed and issued and will come into force. Um, a couple of other issues to report on, uh, not unsurprisingly, there were some representations made to the council at this point uh, from professional dog walkers, um, and consideration has been given to the feasibility of the council introducing a licensing scheme. Discussions are still ongoing on this topic, uh, but obviously um, there are some officers have some reservations about, about, about such a proposal, such a scheme. Just finally to report um, some, work, some of the work of the Environmental Community Waste Team, that's Pat and Jesus' team, and very kindly she didn't allude to this earlier on, thank you Pat. So I'll now explain that, uh, because it fits very naturally into this, this report. Uh, Pat and our team have been working with waste, our waste enforcement contractor, undertaking a number of patrols at various open spaces during the course of the past summer including many of the more popular dog walking locations such as Wimbledon Park 
and Warrior Park. They've been particularly monitoring and tackling dog feline issues. Um, they've spent a lot of time in sites where a large number of dogs are attracted and those typically are places that where professional dog walkers attend. Um, and there's been a lot of work done on that specific issue. So that's the conclusion of my report. I could try to keep it brief. Hopefully it was understandable as well. Um, Any questions? I just realised we're coming close to 10 o'clock, so um, can I ask for, hopefully we'll be finished by 10.15, but if we do run on a little bit, is everyone happy with that? Okay, um, questions, anyone got questions for, for uh, Anthony? Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, in the uh, order itself, um, on page 93, was Article 1.2c, which uh, are characterised as um, going out unequipped, uh, as it were, uh, is that standard work? Uh, I believe it would, be, it, would be, it would be based on our precedents that has been modified based on actual experiences. I, I just wondered if the, if the panel if any other members of the panel had a sort of similar sort of discomfort about this, this is, this is the power of uh, an officer to demand to see whether you are, as far as they're concerned, in the company of the dog with, with an appropriate sort of tool to, to remove waste, but no actual waste is suggested that you know, the dog hasn't fouled anywhere. Um, it just seems to me that you know, that's a bit like going to town without my wallet and someone saying that I might steal something. I don't know if the panel is equally has similar concerns, or if maybe I'm just the only one. Obviously, I don't want dogs to foul in parks, but A and B seem to cover that for me. I don't really see what C is for. I know, with, with respect, it's it's not like going into town without your wallet. It's like uh, going out uh, going out in your car without your driving license. Um, you know, I, 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 or without having a driving license, because you know nothing may happen as a result of you, you you driving your car around without a license. But if it does and you're not prepared for it, you're wrong. That may be a reasonable position to take, as long as the panel kind of agrees that that is the situation. I think all the circumstances it's reasonable to find someone are covered by A and B. I'm not entirely convinced that, you, you know, for example, you may have used the wheel bags and you're now going home. On, under this, you would you could be fined if someone stopped you. Yes, yeah, so the first article being a First article A, the person has a reasonable excuse. I mean, um, <laughs> if you have a question, you can direct it to me, please. Uh, yeah, do you have a question? I was just pointing out that, that the first part of the article would cover that. Chair, it seems that you know, nobody else shares my concerns. So if, if that's the case, then that's the case. Right, okay. I think we just leave it as at that. Do you have a I just have a, a comment. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, one moment. Can I? I'm Jones. I've had a hard time. Thank you. Firstly, I just want to ask you on the full page 87, part um, 27, point 2, uh, bullet point uh, 4. Um, say, for instance, you know, some, I mean, my neighbor may have five dogs, small dogs. Um, you keep going well, you might come out. Jones, I hear you. Oh, sorry, I apologize. Right, you're saying here, um, each person will sell four dogs. Maximum four. Yeah, maximum four. Right? Say, for instance, my, my neighbor, she's a very old person, maybe in her 80s, she normally got walking her dog. She has five dogs, the small ones. She, I mean, she needs to leave one at home and take four out for a walk. My response to that is, uh, we, we certainly gauge a number of people's responses to that and um, you know the numbers of dogs vary quite reasonably and four is the term that's the maximum because 
you know, typically people have one or two dogs, but very rarely they have more than that. And one of the concerns that those in the majority with one or two dogs were concerned about was coming across large numbers of other dogs. So it's a difficult one, and there will be exceptions always. But, you know, I suppose I would say a line needs to be drawn somewhere of what's reasonable and what's unreasonable, and some people will unfortunately have more than that number. Um, isn't it the responsibility of the person who, you know, to make ensure that the dogs are well um, trained or they're um, using their minds, but seem to puzzle properly when going out, so therefore they may, because what we're looking at here is, is uh, maybe incident that um, a dog may attack someone else or attack a child or something like that. So we're looking at protection, really. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, Nick. What, what we're actually looking at is, is what the people uh, in our consultation voted on, if you like. And our, a, consult, a, a, vote, a, a, vote, a consultation doesn't demand that you have to have the, 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 uh, the, the, the conclusion they, they, they asked for. But it was sufficiently large, I mean, not talking about it, it's a sufficiently large proportion that uh, you know, there, there's no room for error. People wanted four dogs maximum, so four dogs maximum it was. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, Russell. Uh, can I ask one? Um, talk about adoption of a new public um, space protection order. If this is all agreed and go through, um, where would that be advertised? Is it like bylaws to yeah, we would certainly make efforts to, to explain to users and the, the community more widely that those dog, the dog, um, the BSPO was in, was in force and there would be a bit of period of grace where we would use that as an educational opportunity as well. So we would make people aware of it in advance, yes. And um, you are aware, of course, that uh, there's been a lot of the, particularly Asian community, don't like dogs and they're fine with them. Yeah, I'd certainly accept that there's some sectors of the community and, and parents with young children are one of those groups as well, particularly. Well, admittedly, but they're, yeah, uh, granted. Um, I mean, I mean, in essence, one of the control measures is about putting on a deep you know, an authorised officer deeming a dog to be relatively out of control and instructing people to do that. That's, that's a catch-all one, instructing people to put dogs under control when they're perceived to be out of control. But this is, this is not the same as dangerous dogs, this is more general dog control measures as opposed to dealing with dangerous dogs, which is, which is a different issue entirely. Okay, I think, I, I think, are we ready to make a, a recommendation to the Implementation or? My question about the bins. Um, as we all know, most of the bins has been um, removed from parks and um, you know, areas where are most usable. Um, so we are wondering whether or not you're looking to um, replace some of the bin, dog bins. Um, I don't believe there are any specific dog bins left in the borough. We removed those more than two years ago. Uh, the, the plan was that normal bin receptacles would be perfectly, perfectly usable and acceptable for people to deposit their dog waste in those or encourage them to take, take those bags home. So, um, I think we really need to Six months, or can it be done immediately? No, I certainly hope to, to progress it much sooner than that, Chair. Um, there's, there's relatively few things still outstanding in this respect. It's mostly about maps and, and the schedules to the, the draft PSPO. So um, I would say at the end of this year, early next year, I would expect, expect this to be. By the end of this year, yeah. then. Is everybody in agreement with that? Yeah. 
Are you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, aren't you happy? Okay. Okay. Um, so the next thing is the work program, and at the last council meeting, we had um, we passed a recommend uh, a motion was passed to council resolves to ask that the Sustainable Communities Overview Scrutiny Panel looks at undertaking a report as part of its work programme which highlights key accessibility issues at local stations, but also outlining positive actions that Merton would, could take to help to improve access. It also asks that it invites key witnesses from Transport for London, Network Rail and South West Trains to the panel if a report is brought. Um, now our, our work program for the next uh, meetings of the, the, the end of the year are very um, busy and very full. So I was thinking of maybe inserting an additional meeting in April, it could, and then maybe in January there are a number of um, items because January is going to be a really busy um, uh, busy meeting as we've been um, discussing the budget and Karen are coming as well so that will take up a lot of time and there are a number of things uh, that could possibly move to April um, which is um, Merton adult education and there's a cabinet priorities area that maybe would be be would sit better in April. Um, commercial commercialization task group action plan. Um, and rather than having performance monitoring in in January. As we have been discussing it in February as well, if you could move it to. Sorry, would you be waiting? Sorry, I'm just saying, the, um, one of the things this committee is responsible for looking at is the public transport. And we often seem to have a public transport needs of the committee meeting, which is independent of this committee. And that is that's mm -hmm. the public. And we normally discuss three or four afternoons at that. This sounds like one item that was actually done before anything on uh, this accreditation. So uh, that may be a way around. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I, I heard that it was it's much easier if they come to this committee rather than other. PTLC meetings for long time. Yeah, it's hard getting them to the meeting, so I've I've been advised. Right. So, I think as a reference. That we were talking about was this committee, not a separate one. Yeah. So, yeah, and the, and the um, motion says to ask the Sustainable Communities Overview and Scrutiny Committee to look at it. So, I think it probably is appropriate that it, we look at it under a separate um, item. Is everybody happy with that? Yes. <laughs> Okay. I wanted to ask about extending one of the other work program items, um, which is possibly possible. Um, uh, Nick Ray was also mentioned in that the housing briefing that Steve Langley did for us a few weeks ago, but that most uh, homeless uh, instances are because of the end of short term tenancies. Um, and I noticed, or I note, that in our March 2019 meeting, we've got an, uh, an update on the impact of the Homelessness Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. I wondered if we could add into that item something uh, on the, the impact of the end of short-term tenancies and, and the plight of uh, private renters, if that's possible. Is that something that would be with both parallel? Yeah, I don't see that. Yeah, I think that sounds like a, a good thing to look at. Yeah. And okay, oh, for the April meeting, I've, the, libraries and heritage with the, the, the oh, it. Okay, so you add it up. So that's it.
Okay, thank you very much for coming and thank, thank you. you. Yeah. She works with Odie Barry. Yeah. Mm -hmm.